Sagason Technology CEO Ed Correa is here to discuss news from Datto, TD Cynics, and ConnectWise, as well as how to deliver customer experience excellence, plus a special guest interview with the Tech Tribe founder Nigel Moore on owner mindset and surviving in uncertain times. It's Channel 4 Weekly number 247, Pickles in a Black Box. Hello and welcome to Channel Pro Weekly, episode number 247. My name is Matt Whitlock, Technology Editor, Online Director, and your host of this fine show for folks out there who, who are like you. And who are you? Well, you got your headphones on and you're thinking to yourself, I am a managed services provider. I am a value-added reseller. I am an IT integrator. I am an IT consultant. I am a system builder. Yes, those system builders, we love all of you as well. You are, you're thinking that you are one, maybe all of those things. Lots of other terms get thrown around, virtual CIO, uh, managed security services. The gist, of the, the gist of it is, is that if you, if you, do, if you service or implement technology solutions in S&B businesses, uh, that, that would be small and medium businesses, businesses, because I stack the acronym in front of that as well. Uh, you are in the right place. And we we are glad you're here. Welcome, welcome, one and all. Make sure you uh, you subscribe on YouTube uh, or uh, subscribe on all, all the podcast places. Tell a friend. We want you to do that as well. All all things that you should do. Go and do that now. We'll wait. It's okay. Go ahead. Go. Okay. Well, actually, we'll move on. You do that while while we're moving on. Uh, joining me this week and most weeks is uh, the man of the hour, the guy who keeps the the trains running on time here at uh, at Channel Pro, Executive Editor Rich Freeman. Welcome, Rich. Hello there, Matt. And it's, uh, uh, and. It's I was just going to say, for those of uh, the folks in our audience who are watching on video, what is unusual about this picture? Uh, oh, I ooh, I know, I know. <laughs> that's a that's a location we haven't seen in a long time. A long time. Yes, yes. <laughs> Did you even remember I'm, the last time you were home? Well, so I I was kind of figuring this out this morning. Um, uh, so I am just back. Like I, I got back through the, um, front door of my home here at, at like, uh, 10 o'clock or so last night. Um, uh, having come back from a TD Cynic show, we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but basically between October 19th and last night, which was, uh, November 16th, I was in Seattle for a grand total of 40 hours. <laughs> now, keep in mind, um, there was like a nine day vacation in there. So it's not like this was some, you know, giant endless business trip, but I went to seven conferences plus Thailand on vacation between October 19th and, and now. And there was one little kind of pit stop after the show we did in Southern California recently, uh, where I was here just long enough to do laundry and then go back out again. Yeah, you know, we didn't get a chance to talk too much about the vacation that you went, but I was joking with uh, Eric Simpson, who was uh, kind of filling in for you while uh, while you were uh, away gallivanting the, the globe. And I was kind of cracking jokes like Rich is Rich is crazy because it's like he he travels all the time for work. He's never home. And then when he goes on vacation, he gets on a plane and travels more. And it's just kind of kind of crazy that you're like never there. So so you you you, you realized that when you got home that Calvin Coolidge was the president the last time you were home. And how <laughs> how thick was the layer of dust on everything when you walked in the door? Yeah, dust not not too bad. I, I was relieved. I was I was waiting to see are my plants all dead. Or, you know, because I did get a chance somewhere in the middle of that uh, trip to to water them. And uh, and I should say, I, I travel a lot, as as you know. So I'm, I'm very good at selecting plants that don't need, you know, cactuses and so on, stuff that can go without water for extent. So they, uh, they're they doing okay. And so you can also just get like plastic plants. That would work too, you know. Then you don't even have to worry about watering them. But I, I do, I do know that you were- <laughs> Yeah, they're, I knew- I even more work. <laughs> yeah right or if, if rich if you if you decide to get a pet you're gonna get a, like a pet camel you know because you only have to give it water like once a month yeah yeah <laughs> so well oh, good glad you're home glad you're there uh wait we if, if for those who are watching listening you yeah you, you heard his voice you saw him briefly who is that guy it's a guy that uh we haven't seen in a little while but i'm super excited that he's back with us today he's the founder and ceo of sagacent technologies which is a 23 year old almost 23, like to, oh, like a month away, managed uh, service provider in Silicon Valley. He's a 45-year IT pro. He brings a very unique 
a uh, blend of business management experience, operational know-how, and computer industry knowledge to Silicon Valley. Plus, he's also a super funny guy and super smart and just a lot of fun to have around. So excited that we get him back. Please welcome Ed Correa. And I did it right. You did. You did and I think we should drop the mic because I'll never get a better introduction than that. <laughs> mic drop. I get the rolled R. We were, we were laughing before the show. Like, like I'm like, okay, let me make sure I'm pronouncing this right. And he's like, I, I it needs to be Correa. Because you got to get the R in there because he wants to be Italian or, or something like that. And I'm like, hey, let's do it. Let's go for it. Uh, and, and we pulled it off. I'm super sad. Ed, it's awesome to see you. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. I love being here. <laughs> uh, for those who may not have caught a previous episode that you were on, uh, go ahead and take a couple minutes. Uh, tell us a little bit more about you, about Sagacent Technologies and what you do there. Uh, Sagacent's been a heck of a journey, uh, like a lot of people in the audience. You know, I used to work for other people doing IT. Um, I grew frustrated, like a lot of our friends, decided I can do it better, uh, hung out a shingle, started a company, and then found out, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> it's like <laughs> running a company is very different than just being an IT person. So it's been a nearly 23-year-old uh, education. Uh, the, however, the last four or five years have been the best of my career, and uh, I'm I'm really liking it. And what do you think attributes to that? That the, the, these last few years have been have been the best. Is just did you finally you know learn something well, about, that you weren't doing before? About, or? about ten years ago, I decided to follow the advice of Arlen Sorensen and start developing a leadership team. Uh, that would hold some of the reins of the company. And I say 10 years ago, and he said, but Ed, the last four or five have been the best. Well, it took a while to find those people and get them to stay and then develop them so that they were accountable and, and able to execute. But once they started doing that, the company really started blossoming. And uh, it's it's great. That's awesome. You know, it's it's funny, your, your, your journey is a lot like others because you say, I was working for people and I thought, Hey, you know what? I, I could do this IT thing. I, I know that. What what was the initial shock when you started when you went out on your own, like running the business? What what were the you know the first three things that you learned that you didn't expect that you would have to learn? Well, the first thing actually, uh, my wife enlightened me. Um, she said, uh, "Why did you leave a very well paid job so we could starve?" <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, and um, the next thing was. Uh, People, clients didn't necessarily uh, want everything I thought that was a good idea for them. That was a bit of a blow to my ego. Um, and lastly, uh, I didn't know near about uh, as much as fi about finance uh, that I thought I knew. But uh, over the decades, I've, I've learned a great deal about finance. <laughs> So, so when you started out, were you were you following a little bit more of a break fix model? Um, I was, oh, yeah, that, that was probably yeah. more of the standard back then. And, and that's why the uh, starving part, my wife referenced, um, because I would you know we'd have a good month, make money, and then nothing, and then a good month and make money and nothing. And uh, managed services really hadn't become a thing yet. Uh, at least it was only in the enterprise. Um, and uh, I came up with this beautiful term to describe it. Uh, and went to all my clients after procrastinating for about two years. And I said, um, we're going to put everybody on a contract and you'll get services within the scope of the contract, but it's going to be a set fee so that I know what we're making and I can afford to hire staff and know that they can get paid. And I was terrified that we we're going to lose everybody. Oddly, we lost two. That was it. Everybody oh, said, man. great idea. Where do I sign? And I'm going, why did I procrastinate for two years? So uh, uh, the, I came up with a wonderful term that just rolls off your tongue. I called it Comprehensive Infrastructure Support, or CIS. Um, obviously, we don't call it that in the industry because that was a terrible name. Um, but uh, no, it, it, it's interesting in our industry. There are very few really unique ideas. We all, we all are struggling with the same problems, and the same solutions help all of us. So I'm a big believer in the community. And... Uh, you know, started with Harry Brelsford by reading some of his books, uh, helped me get going. And then when I met Arlen Sorensen in 2004 in a conference in Chicago, uh, really started helping me. And uh, as Arlen often uh, points out, you know, if you just follow the advice you're given, you get a lot further. But no, people like to 
create their own ways. And then you, after you bang your head against the wall enough and you go, you know what? That was pretty good advice. I should have taken that. <laughs> well, that's good. Well, I'm glad that, uh, that it's been a, a good journey for you and that you're, you've gotten a lot of success. I, I think it, it always makes sense, right? I mean, it, it, everyone had fear going to their, their customers and they're saying like, we want to put you on contracts, but it's preventative, you know, like, like this is all like, let's prevent problems rather than just fix them when they come up. And let's, uh, let's make sure that if you do have problems that we, we have plans in place to deal with them. I, that seems like it would make sense to most people. I would uh, make sense to us in IT, not always to clients. <laughs> You know, I'm, yeah. I, I'm actually really interested to know more. I, I mean, it, it, it's all sort of in the rearview mirror at this point. Yeah. But I mean, I, I've been writing about managed services since like 2005. And the, the conventional wisdom back then was you're going to have a really hard time converting your break fix clients into managed services clients because they're used to just paying when something breaks and, you know, wrapping their brain around the new model is hard. The net new clients, no sweat, exactly. harder. But you, you had, you figured out a way to do it, um, actually, to get the, the, the break fix folks bought into managed services. I, uh, yes. Um, and, and it's kind of like even just raising your rates. When you get over yourself and just go do it, it's like pulling off a Band-Aid. Um, you're so much happier. And you always, almost always find out it wasn't nearly as bad as you imagined it to be. So. Yeah. Well, good. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad it worked out for you. And and uh, yeah, and, and pretty much that. works out for everybody in our industry if they just go do it. It's like you know we're in an inflationary time. I hope everybody listening to this raised rates because you got to take care of your people. Your people are your best resource. And uh, you know, go start at the beginning of this year. We saw where inflation was going, and I made a promise to my staff we were going to give them cost of living adjustments. I couldn't afford to do it all at once. But I said, at the beginning of every quarter this year, you'll get a 2% adjustment. At the end of the year, everybody will be raised 8%. Then I had to go back to my clients and say, hey, I'm raising your rates 8%. <laughs> right, well, right, of course, that's what you gotta do, right? Like you gotta be in business because if you're not in business, you can't service the customers, right? So Absolutely. And when you point a... that out to them, suddenly they become a little bit more understanding. Gee, you guys might fail. Yeah, but... <laughs> You can help prevent that. <laughs> right. Just like their business, right? Like, well, if you got to end up paying your employees more and you're not charging more for the things that you do, you're going to go under too, right? So like we, we're all in this boat together. Let's all, uh, let's, let's all stay alive together at the same time and not, not sink. Uh, so Ed, uh, you, we, we were joking about uh, Rich traveling at the beginning of the show a little bit and uh, where he goes, do you, do you do a lot of travel outside of, um, outside of work stuff, like for fun or for recreation? Oh, for uh, not nearly enough for fun. Um, uh, my wife and I try to do something fun every quarter. Usually that's just a weekend away, but we usually get, you know, two weeks away during the year. But uh, speaking of, of Rich, we ran into each other at a conference or two uh, recently. Um, I hate it when I travel and there are two conferences on the same week. I can't even imagine Rich's schedule. But, you know, last week I was at my ConnectWise Evolve meetings for the first half of the week. And then I was at the IT, uh, ConnectWise IT Nation Connect conference the second part of the week. It was a grueling week. You know, it started Sunday, ended Saturday. 4,700 people, uh, 12 hour days, go, go, go. Um, but you learn a lot and you get to meet the community and it's a wonderful community. Awesome. And yeah. then there was a hurricane. <laughs> and which, which happily didn't devastate the hotel we were in. Um, but there was a lot of concerns. I mean, the, so this conference, the IT Nation Connect was so big, they booked a number of hotels. And then they also booked large buses to ferry people from these hotels to the convention hall. Um, evidently, for some reason, once winds exceed 50 miles an hour, they start looking at these buses like sails. And so the bus services were telling the ConnectWise folks, well, we're not gonna ferry people because of the hurricane. And uh, you know, it's like, well, oh, wow, we didn't plan for that. What do we do? We can't get the people from the rooms, from their hotels to the conference. Well, happily, Nicole started dissipating. And by the time it got to Orlando, the winds were much more reasonable. I think the buses only didn't run for a couple of hours. But uh, no, we dodged a bullet and a lot of people were fretting. And I'm going, hey, as long as we got power, uh, you know, and we're warm inside the building, I don't care what's outside the building, so. 
Anyway, Wait, what 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 would have happened if if the buses stopped? I'm kind of curious. Like, if somebody well, people wouldn't have been able to get to the conference. <laughs> people would have been frustrated. Um, you know, lots of complaints. Uh, I can only imagine. I I've never put on a conference. Uh, I've only done lunch and learns and, and breakfast and learns, and those make me sweat. And you know, 35 people in a room. Uh, I can't even imagine 4,700 people. I mean, you get a a mass, an angry mob. Here's a pair of sneakers. Start walking. <laughs> uh, that would be, yeah, that would be crazy. So, well, good. Well, I'm glad uh, the hurricane wasn't bad. And I, I know we're, we're probably going to talk a little bit more about that um, as we go on here. We've got, we got a fun show ahead. Uh, we got a lot of things we're going to talk about. Probably we should start diving in here before we get, uh, we get too far, but we're, we're going to talk about Datto. They're in the news. We're going to be talking about um, TD Cynics' conference. So I think Rich alluded to that. We'll be talking about uh, uh, ConnectWise. We're going to be talking about um, customer experience excellence, how to deliver that. That's going to be a really good one. Plus, oh, we got a really fun interview uh, that we got with uh, Nigel Moore. He's the founder and CEO of the Tech Tribe. We got that coming up a little later on in the show. Um, and uh, we, we did have to record that earlier, but Ed was still uh, with us for that. So he's here with us the whole show, which is uh, which is awesome. And, uh, and yeah, we got we got a lot, right? This is gonna be a good, a good packed show. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and and dive in and talk about Datto. Um, this is no surprise. I mean, they've been they've been kind of like going down the security path here for a while. This is the next obvious evolution. But what did they what did they do in security? Uh, well, this is this is even less surprising than that because, um, as Ed knows, Ed was at DattoCon uh, back at the beginning of September, as I was. Um, Datto announced at that show a few months ago, we have an EDR product coming. And sure enough, it reached market officially uh, this past week. It is called, um, very creatively, what, what would you call an EDR solution from Datto? How about Datto EDR? That's the name <laughs> name of the system there. We, we do know more about it, actually, um, a, a little more about it than we did um, a few months back. So um, it will protect uh, desktops, notebooks, servers on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Um, the whole thing, everything I'm about to describe is basically oriented around the MSP who does not have in-house security expertise, basically, but is responsible for securing clients. And so they're trying to make something that is very complicated, relatively simple. Um, and so what they have done, they have an alert dashboard that maps alerts to the MITRE attack framework, which some folks might be um, familiar with. And the idea is that's going to give you some context. It's going to kind of help you understand what kind of threat or issue is this um, and uh, and what does that imply for uh, for the customer? Then they have what they call click to respond functionality. So you get an alert, you're in the alert dashboard, you look at the, the mapping against the framework, you'll learn a little bit about what's going on. And then you click a button and um, you can execute the uh, remediation measures that the system recommends. And I'm sure you can kind of alter that remediation process or execute one of your own. But if you just want to do click respond done, you can do that. Isolate hosts, terminate processes, delete files, whatever it is that kind of needs to be done um, in respond to that detected issue. Um, as the Datto folks told us back at DattoCon, this integrates out of the box first day on the market pretty tightly with Datto RMM. So you can do most all maybe of, of what I just described from inside Datto RMM as opposed to swivel chairing between um, a couple of different uh, interfaces. Um, they, there were two other security products that Datto talked about at DattoCon. Um, one is a managed SOC uh, service, which somewhere along the way between then and now apparently came out. I just discovered this week that is now it's up on the connect or the uh, connect wise shame on me on the data website um and you don't even uh, know where you are anymore rich <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah believe me i yeah you don't want to make a mistake like that when you're interviewing the ceo of the other company but anyway that's a, that's a different story um but uh yeah it, it it's up on the the data website now um the the third uh, system that they talked about which as far as i know is not actually available yet is a sassy system uh, and I imagine that one is coming relatively soon as well. But like, to your original point, um, Matt, they have been building and expanding a, a security suite for really this year has been the big year, I think, for, for data. They came out with a, a cloud security product uh, um, earlier on this year, and now they have the CDR system, they have the managed SOC, they've got the SASE service coming. So they, as they like to say, they have been in the security business 
for a while. They they have an RMM system that does patch management. That's security, BDR. That's a layer in the security stack. But they they are developing a uh, a family of sort of security specific products and services right now that um, that fit into are part of dovetail with the Kaseya IT complete platform. Data was part of Kaseya now, as we all still kind of try to um, internalize and, and adjust to that fact. Kaseya did not have an EDR system, and, and they do now in the form of this uh, Datto EDR product. I, that was like the first question I was going to ask is like, because Kaseya has got such an expansive portfolio of tools. Are they, is this something that's kind of ground up built? as new or you know where does it fit in with the rest of the stuff and it sounds like they did not have an edr solution so this kind of plugs that hole that was missing in the kaseya complete platform and they've just branded it with the datto brand yeah well and you know i'm uh i'm trying to remember and it's probably in this article i wrote somewhere in there it, it, the datto edr is based on technology they acquired along with um another company and so i'm, I'm sure this product has been in the works for for some time probably well before Kaseya bought Datto. Um, and so, yeah, they were they were kind of charging down the road towards creating their own EDR product. And from Kaseya's standpoint, it must've been like, great, because that's one of the big things in security that we don't do right now. They, they have been doing managed detection and response via their rocket cyber unit for uh, a few years. But now this, like you said, kind of fills a gap. Yeah. Now, Ed, uh, Datto has a tendency to make things very easy, very simple. And it, as Rich was describing this, it's like, it's it's amazing how advanced security has become just a click a button kind of process, especially at least for known threats. Um, yeah, I'm sure you use plenty of cybersecurity tools. Anything here strike you as interesting or good or, you know, well, contrast it with it, what you're using? Well, it's it's actually fascinating. Um, but, you know, our, as an industry, we're we're running into a situation where the low end managed service provider is signing up with, with these companies and they're telling their clients they're doing the security. Very often, and my, my fear specifically about this da data uh, EDR is it expects you to do stuff. It's going to tell you about the alerts. You need to take action. And if your people are not adequately trained or you don't have adequate resources, you're not gonna have the resources to do anything with it. And so just having the EDR out there is somewhat helpful, but then you have to be able to remediate issues and take action. And so I'm seeing three classes of these managed service providers uh, develop. You've got the very small companies that are getting the product so they can say they're doing security, but they're, they're delivering them almost as point products, very often not wanting to manage them. I think this is very potentially hazardous. There are the MSP plus group, which are deploying the products and bringing on the, the people to manage it. And then you're getting to the MSSPs that are really develop, developing it themselves rather than partnering with another. Um, it's a fascinating thing. It's fraught with peril. Um, you know, our industry, uh, we're, we're in a, a very a big pickle with litigious issues, you know, where customers, if they get hacked and you didn't do things to their liking, you are in a dangerous spot. So people should really think about this. Um, I'd be very careful about just grabbing a product and then over promising to my customers that, hey, we've got you covered. Do you, do you really? It's, it's a really good point. But is there like a fourth class where there's, you know, you could be a smaller company and then say outsource, you know, do a managed sock somewhere. So you detect and then you can throw remediation over to- That's, a that's true. That you have. Uh, it, but you know, we didn't go that route where we had, we were dependent on somebody else because in the past we tried a couple providers where they said they were going to do the stuff. Very often they became a black box and you could not tell what, what they were doing. You couldn't tell if things were really secure or not. So there, I'm sure there are partners out there that you could partner with, but you've got to make sure that a high level of transparency exists because whose throat is on the chopping block? Yours. The customer is looking to you to protect them. So you've got to think about this. And so I hope people- It's another pickle you got to deal with is transparency. So you want them to be more like a pickle jar and not a I, black box, right? Yeah, well, as long as the, the jar is clear. <laughs> as, long as, it's, as long as it's a clear jar. Okay, so I have to ask just because it's important. Uh, and these are the things that keep me up at night if I don't know. Are you a bread and butter guy or a dill guy? 
Oh, um, actually neither. I've discovered these, what is it? Famous Dave's has a jar of these spicy uh, pickle chips. The and, spicy... and, and I order them by the, by the box and there's always one in the fridge and uh, they are tasty, uh, spicy, a little sweet. Um, they make a great snack. They're much better for me than eating pickles or uh, sorry, much better than eating uh, potato chips. So try to cut down on the carbs. <laughs> so I, I I should say I uh, I'm a huge fan of of deli food like a really good kosher I just love pastrami and um honestly that the pickle is sometimes the best part it's like wait a minute where's my pickle you know that yeah. that's, that's what I'm all about yeah it's the contrast with those meats and the sauces and uh, then that pickle that pickle better be crunchy you yep. snap it oh yeah, I, I've had the famous Dave's um, spice. Those are good. I'm I'm a a classic kosher dill guy though. Like that, there is no no greater pickle to me. And I don't know, I don't know the. I, I've, I've had discussions with lots of people about pickles before. But strangely enough, for some reason, I do. Anybody eat bread and butter pickles? Like they're disgusting. Do, do you guys like those at all? Like I don't really have ever met anybody that's like, yeah, bread and butter, man. That's that's my jam, or my pickle, I guess. <laughs> Ed, you, are you bread and butter guy? Do you ever do you like those or do you think? Uh, well, if good? if they're served with like you order a sandwich and they're there, I'll do it. But I've I've never bought them myself. <laughs> right, Rich? Are you, do you ever buy bread and butter? Nobody buys them. Do you buy them? No, no, no I don't think so. I don't think I think they just expire on store shelves and they're that you know they're just there to take up space. Is that? Uh... <laughs> That's all it is. Okay, enough with pickles. We've we've talked about that enough. Uh, Rich, is there anything else on Dado EDR? Did they um is is this like an add on thing if you're a Dado partner? Uh, do you have to subscribe to this? Is there costs? Is it just rolled in with with Dado RMM? How how are they positioning this for provide uh, for partners? This is a separate product, so I don't know very much about the pricing, but this is something that you you buy in addition to whatever you're buying now. Okay. All right. Well, uh, we'll put a link to the article uh, in the show notes for channel for this episode of uh, Channel Four Weekly. So it's episode two forty seven. Go and uh, look that up there. If you're on your phone, you can open the de the, the description area. We usually have the links in there for you, so you can look, go and click off because we're just kind of covering the highlights here and giving you our, our our opinions and and initial thoughts. But if there's a lot more detail that you want to go and check out, if you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe, hit the bell, hit the like, hit the thumbs up. Hit there's a lot of a lot of buttons. Hit all of those. Don't hit the thumbs down no we don't like that button that's an evil evil button that we we should never press when we're when we're watching channel for weekly uh but we do want you to leave a comment so uh leave comments and uh and and, and have fun with us there uh but also same thing open the description area all the links are there you can read along while we kind of go through this so you can get uh all of the detail uh that uh that rich has uh provided or rich or whoever whoever has written uh these things for you to uh to check out uh next story is we've got four final so rich you've you've gone through all the insights and this is like your final four like college basketball uh and so your final four insights which which insight is going to win the championship or did uh, i completely misinterpret this headline something like that <laughs> yeah that not not too far off but in it, no um so this uh, I, I, I have uh, uh, a number of stories from the TD Cynic show that I just attended up on the website. And, you know, if, if you are a member of or are familiar with um, their community solve organization, that, that's what the conference I was attending was. It was uh, the first ever meeting of their community solve organization, which is this um, uh, sort of umbrella group that they created when Tech Data and Cynix came together to house the partner communities that um, those companies had separately. So Cynex had Varnex, um, Tech Data had Tech Select. If you are familiar with those communities, um, there is a story up on our website now you'll want to take a look at because um, contrary to the original plan for those communities, they're going to get rolled together into, into one thing um, at some point down the road. And so there's that. And, and there's um, an article about um, the, the view on uh, the industry and the economy in 2023 from uh, the uh, point of view of TD Cenex up there as well. Um, what I wanted to do here, though, was just call attention to something. This is actually from an article that I literally wrote on the plane home uh, last night. And, you know, how many times, Matt, have we talked about on this podcast, have we written about it at Channel Pro, the fact that 
distributors do all sorts of stuff that their partners don't know about, don't take advantage. I was just talking about it with um, Bob Stegner from TD Cinex uh, a couple of days ago, and he he practically doubled over with frustration. It makes him crazy. There are all these things we do that nobody... So I've been kind of talking about that, covering that for years. At this conference this week, I learned about a few things TD Cinex does, ne didn't know about it. It's like there's so much stuff whoever your distributor is, in Ingram Micro, whatever, there's so much stuff going on that it's very easy not to know. So let me just tell you about a few things that I found really interesting that came up um, during the show. Um, there was a, a, a presentation, actually a couple of different presentations from people in their finance organization. And uh, one of the things that came up, they, they obviously have a very sophisticated um, credit organization, credit rating organization, they're very, very good, are they not, at um, assessing your credit worthiness, right? Well, they can, they are more than willing to apply that skill to your customers. And there was a, a, a VP from the, the credit organization who said, hey, I, I run into this situation, you as a partner probably run into this situation, the, the sales guy comes into your office and says, I've got this huge deal uh, on the table here, ready to go with a customer you've never heard of before, and you as the business owner are thinking, you know, is this a, a customer who's going to pay off on that project, should I be trusting them? Um, at TD Cynics, and I, again, I'm sure this is true of other distributors as well, you can go to them, go to their credit department and say, help me figure out whether this new customer I want to sign on and do something very expensive for is credit worthy or not. And they won't give you a credit rating, um, this guy said, but they will give you a credit opinion based on their very expert opinion about who does or doesn't deserve um, to get credit. Here was another thing um, from the, the same uh, guy on stage was talking about, never heard of this before, but sometimes uh, a partner who is having trouble getting an, an end user, a customer, to pay a bill that's been sitting around on the accounts receivable report forever, can, will go to TD Cynix, go to their distributor and say, help me on collections. Instead of hiring like a co collections agency or whatever, Apparently, you can go to your distributor and say, I need collections help, and they're prepared to do that. Um, another, a third thing, and then we can kind of um, move on here. And I'll, I'll, I'll say before I get into this, um, they don't know this at TD Cynics yet, but I'm, I'm going to try to get the guy who was talking about this onto the show with us, Matt, because I don't really understand. This is not my world, and I, I want to understand it better. But there was a, uh, an onstage one-to-one -one with David Jordan who is the um, CFO for the Americas uh, at uh, TD Cinex. And um, TD Cinex worldwide is a 50 plus billion dollar a year company. I believe in, in the Americas where David Jordan is CFO, it's you know 35 to 40 billion. This is a big business. And so the people who work for David Jordan, David Jordan himself, the, these are you know, Walt, very sophisticated Wall Street sorts. Um, they're, they're, you know, they they are in the tech industry, but they also understand the world of high finance in a very high level, um, sophisticated kind of way. And he was asked during this one to one about sell. You know, and, and MSPs are obviously getting offers left and right from private equity firms. That is one of the um, either exit options or growth options that every MSP um, pretty much is, is at least evaluating right now. Jordan was asked about this on stage and he didn't say you shouldn't do it, but he did kind of talk about some alternatives to that that people might not be aware of. And so, and one of the things he said is, look, there, there is a playbook that the, the PE firms play by. And if you if if you're me, if you're in my world, like we all know what that playbook is. We know what they do to raise money and invest money and and get a return on capital that they consider acceptable and so on. And one of these sort of lesser known services you can get from uh, TD Cynics and I'm sure other uh, distributors, call them up and tell them I'm thinking about selling to private equity. What should I know? And Jordan said, look, we'll we'll show you the playbook. We we know how they do what they do. We'll we'll tell you all about it. Um, and one of the things he said is once you know, and this is going to depend a lot, I think, on who you are and how mature you are in, in, in your business and so on. But he said, look, once you've had a chance to read the playbook, um, metaphorically speaking, you might be able to run those plays yourself. But, and he didn't get into this in detail. Again, want to have him on the show. 
But you may be able to capitalize your business the way a private equity firm would without actually selling to private equity. You can kind of do what they do um, to raise money and retain ownership of the company. Another way um, to uh, take it in this case to actually do business with a private equity firm without actually selling your business, he said, is to take advantage of what he called, and I assume this is a an, an industry term, not his term, alternative financing. And so he said that, and he, he may have been speaking maybe about the bigger PE firms here, but the you know the PE firms they all have their PE arm that goes out and makes investment in growth stage companies or what have you. But most of them have a credit arm as well. And lots of folks, myself included until this week, you know, don't know that that's there, don't know what that does, don't take it advantage of it. And in this case, you know, one of your alternatives with a PE firm is to sell the business to the private equity firm. The other alternative is to go to that credit um, unit and borrow money from the private equity firm. So again, you you are still in, it's your business. You now have a loan from a private equity firm. And Jordan said, look, they're, they're going to charge you 10 to 15% interest, which at first blush is like, are you kidding me? Why, why am I paying 10 to 15% interest? But he said, look at it this way. They will only buy an MSP if they are confident that they can get a 30% um, annualized return on that investment. That's sort of the, the magic number, the target number for these PE firms. They want a 30% annualized rate of return on their investment. And there is a big difference, a big gap uh, spread between 30% and 10 to 15%. If you can do what they think they can do to generate that 30% return on investment, you're now keeping, you're pocketing the, the delta between the 15% interest you're paying and that 30%. So again, under certain circumstances for certain um, companies, you're, you're going to want to, you know, consult with an expert, yada, 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 but that that might be something to, uh, to consider. And for, for our purposes here, kind of the big thing there is this, this, all this stuff I'm talking about here, that's a conversation you can have with your distributor. You know, call up the finance guys and and I'll I'll end it here. I, I I did a conversation with one of their executives named Christy Kirby. She works with vendors. We were mostly talking about vendor relationships, but I asked her at one point, what what's the big takeaway you want attendees at the show to go home with? And she didn't talk about anything specific to what she did. What she said basically is, I want people to know whatever it is you need or are wondering about or thinking about call us because <laughs> it's not guaranteed we can do it or help with it, but you'd be surprised how often it is. And this is a perfect example of that. You're starting to contemplate private equity, probably never occurred to you to call your DISTI and see what they could tell you, but that it's, it's a good example of the kind of thing that they can do. You know, Rich, if you don't get Jordan on to have this conversation in depth, I'm going to be so disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, that's going to be one I have to listen to play back a couple times because this whole thing about finance in our industry, it is just, it's made it a whole different game. And a lot of us, like I said, that was one of the things I didn't understand at all. Still don't think I do. Um, uh, you know, we need to understand it. Uh, now, I, I want to caution the people that are listening. If you're the typical small MSP, uh, I would advise against trying to take out a loan and saying you're going to do it. Look at the track record of your company. If you haven't been doing it before, why is it suddenly going to change? But there are groups of uh, MSPs doing this themselves, getting together, uh, uh, grouping their companies together to make a bigger pile of money, to be much more attractive to the PE companies. Um, it's it's fascinating. And I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that uh, Tech Data Cynics has these, these resources. I just don't know who to call yet. I can't wait to put that to, a, to the test. Um, they talked about the PE playbook. Yeah, I've I've been to so many conferences and people have talked about it. He he alluded to the fact that there's a written one. I'd like to get a copy of that and read that. Um, but it's fascinating. Our industry has changed so much over the years. It, yeah, it, and it it we, it's worth pointing out that like Rich, Rich you you noted that we we talked about this several times. Distributors do a lot, <laughs> right? And it, it's it, we're always learning new things that they do that we did we didn't know. I would never have expected. And Ed, I, did you even know this that you could use you could use your distributor as a credit collection company? Like that's crazy. Uh, no, I, I was actually making notes as Rich was speaking, and I'm going, I 
I didn't know that. You know, one of the best practices I was taught years ago was build deep relationships with your vendors. Distributors are in there. The deeper the relationship, you're going to find out about all these things that are that are available to you. But I think most of us you just have that relationship and we're getting the tip of the iceberg of their capabilities. It's fascinating. So, so Ed, do you work with a distributor or yes. multiple? multiple? Which one? What, multiple. Which ones do you uh, tend we to? We buy most of our product from Tech Data. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's funny. I was talking with one of my purchasers this morning. At saying I was, I was picking on another vendor, and I was saying I really, I'd really like you to have a deeper relationship with this vendor and find out all they can do for us. Guess what? I'm going to do after this call. I'm going to call him back. Call Tech Data. Find out about what they can do for us. Yeah, and it, it, there's they do so much. You could almost like we, we we've joked before, but you could almost be a one man show running everything through a distributor, and probably build a fairly decent business out of that model. Um, you know, it won't may, may not be uh, quite as profitable, but you could certainly do that. Uh, so I guess the, the and now, now, Rich. Oh wait a minute, wait a minute. Let, let me let me. I, I might disagree. So people have advocated, uh, at least going back fifteen, nearly twenty years, um, that MSPs, certain MSPs, should accept the role of just being a credit card uh, processor. And you outsource all these things. And we just talked about this a little while ago. In the security state, you could have you know a SOC that you've outsourced to, and these different things. Uh, at the IT Nation Connect conference, I met two partners who have a really great business, and they are the entire company. Uh, this company is much much bigger than mine, and it's just the two of them because they've outsourced everything, and they leverage the hell out of their vendors. And yeah. I'm going, inter interesting model, very different than mine. They found a way to make it work. Yeah, you can lever your, leverage your vendors and leverage distributors because, I mean, yeah. if it comes to like, oh, you get a, a client needs cables ran, well, you can go to your distributor and they and hire through them and they'll yeah. dispatch their people and they act as you, which is yeah. just crazy, right? So uh, and all the white label tools and all that stuff, there's, there's just so much out there that you can do that you can leverage. You know, obviously you're not... You, there, there's cost to that. So you have to, in order to build that business, yeah. you have to look at that. But yeah, it's absolutely true. There's so many things you can leverage and, and do that a lot of people may not really realize it. And, and Ed, you work with multiple distributors. Do you find that, you know, some distributors, you know, like, like for example, Tech Data does this credit reporting thing where you can go and you can find out if a client's credit worthy. Once one vet distributor does it, do they all tend to do it? Or do you have to go to certain distributors to get certain uh, things? Like Rich said, I think they have a lot of things that they get frustrated we don't know about, but I've never been told about these features. I mean, uh, client credit, non client credit opinions, that would be, I can think of several deals that I would have liked to have known that up front. I didn't know they did this. Assisting with collections, I didn't know that. I would have never thought of it. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of like the, the reason I go to partner conferences is they're telling you about the things very often. You're going, oh my God, I had no idea they did that. So um, yeah, I must admit, Rich's uh, reporting on the uh, Tech Data Cynics uh, conference made me go, gee, was that a conference I should have gone to? I, you know, but yeah, it's a little time, but what are you going to do? <laughs> I know, you can't go to them all. There's so many. There's so many yeah. now. It's really yeah. hard to get to, to You'll all You'll never do any business. <laughs> right, right. Good. You know, Rich, we could almost have an entire conference just on things distributors do, right? Yeah. That could be a that could be a whole <laughs> conference, a whole show, I could a whole series of shows uh, of like unknown things distributors do can do for you if you if you know about it. Um, anyway, well, good stuff. Great article. Uh, go folks and check that out and learn about some of these other things that they do that you may not be uh, might, you may not realize and that might be really important stuff. Can, um, can I give you one one last piece of color on that story that's just too good not to share? Absolutely. Um, the, the guy, the speaker at the show who talked about, hey, we could do collections for you. He's an executive at TD Cinex named Jay Snyder. Um, and he, uh, early in his career, he was a repo man in Detroit, Michigan. So like, he's going to get your money, folks. The, this guy he knows, knows how to do how it. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, hey, uh, Ed. This is this is your customer calling. Um, why is there a guy here that has it says it says TD Cynics on his shirt, and he's got a he's got a tire iron, 
and a, <laughs> and a baseball bat. What what's going on well, here? Well, Matt, you remember that money you owed me? I suggest you give it to him now. <laughs> Uh, the we don't need to question the methods of the distributor, just the fact that they're effective. That's all we need to do. That's awesome. Uh, all right, so Rich, let's let's move on. We got one more news story we want to talk about, and that is uh, ConnectWise. Uh, we've been talking a lot lately because they had their their big conference. They're investing in well, what they they say they're investing in these things. Are they? And what are they? Well, they are, um, and it's, it's security that we're talking about here. Th this is actually kind of perfect because it's going to tie in um, both to what we were just talking about, which is stuff vendors can do for you that you may not know about and therefore may not be taking advantage of, and um, exactly what Ed was talking about a little bit earlier on the show, this idea that there are three or maybe four different kind of ways for an MSP to be in, in security. Um, so, um, you know, we, we spoke about the ConnectWise conference on last week's show, but that, that conference kind of started late on a Wednesday. It ended um, end of day Friday. We recorded the show Thursday morning. So, I mean, most of the show hadn't happened. I really hadn't um, interviewed any of their executives by that point. Um, this is a story that I wrote after the, the last episode came out, and it's based on um, interviews um, with two uh, ConnectWise executives, one named Jay Ryersey and uh, another named Patrick Beggs. Patrick is their um, CISA, their Chief Information Security Officer. I'll give you one quick note that I think will be of interest to people about that conversation. But the, the main thing I wanted to call attention to, um, I sat down with Jay, um, I you know, two years ago, two and a half years ago, really, um, I covered the launch of um, the organization within ConnectWise called IT Nation Secure, um, which uh, Jay heads up. And to be honest, I mean, I, I have attended an IT Nation Secure event, um, you know, actually two, one online, one in person, but I haven't really, really been keeping close tabs on um, IT Nation Secure sort of beyond that conference. And, um, I, you know, Jay updated me um, last week and it was very interesting to me. So um, they've got, first of all, um, they've got over 2,000 members in the IT Nation Secure uh, uh, partner program, including apparently Ed Correa. So we'll, we'll get some input from him on this very shortly. Um, anyone who transacts business with ConnectWise around security can get into this program for free. So th it's not like there are, um, you know, onerous hurdles you got to get past or fees you have to pay. A free program, you just have to be a transacting ConnectWise partner. First thing they're going to do is hand you a bunch of not for resale licenses because their logic is the first thing we want is to make sure you are secure, your business. Then we can start talking about how you secure your customers. And everything that happens from that point forward, basically, is based around the assumption that um, you are probably not positioned yet to deliver security the way it should be delivered to your customers. So I mean, basically what Jay said is the most successful um, managed security providers, not like the full-blown MSSPs with um, you know in-house in socks and so on, but the companies with really successful, profitable security practices in the MSP space have at least one person who does nothing else but that kind of you know run that part of the business. And obviously, if you are getting a security practice off the ground, you have no revenue. You you know it's it's difficult to go out and hire that person and make all these investments um, before you're actually producing the revenue that's going to uh, enable you to do that. And so this whole IT Nation Secure program and everything I'm about to describe here is just designed to get you to that point, to fill the gaps, to do the things you can't afford to do so that you get to the point where you can swim on your own, essentially, and you don't need the program anymore. So what are we talking about here? Well, they have a team of people who can help you draft operational um, procedures, um, produce documentation, craft policies. They have this whole set of, uh, th this word again, playbooks, um, which in a very detailed way will tell you, here's what you've got to do, um, you know, beginning, intermediate, advanced to run a security practice. Um, and it, it's, this is not stuff that you're going to get through in 30 or 60 days. It can You can spend a year um, easily on each one of these playbooks, apparently, but that's how specific and detailed and prescriptive they are about what it takes to get a security practice off the ground. They have got, and this is one of those investments, Matt, they have got a 14-person marketing team dedicated to IT Nation Secure that will help you build a website, um, create presentation, whatever it is you got to do to create business. They are available to you at no cost 
to do that for you. They've got two people who do nothing but fly around the country and speak at partner events. So if you do a lunch and learn or some other kind of conference and it's about security and you want an expert speaker, you know, get on the calendar and they will fly somebody out to you and, and do that for you. They will help you develop and deliver demos. Um, they, there is MDF, uh, if you remember. There's something that they call earned cooperative marketing funds. So basically the more money you spend on security products from ConnectWise, they, they, you know, they will um, give you a, a percentage of that spend to then spend on marketing activities. So like 2,000 partners in the, the program these days, they've handed out $2.7 million this year in earned co-op funding. Um, and then, and this, this is worth noting, um, everything I've just described is, is about security, but just within the last um, week or two, they've added a whole similar set of resources specifically for BDR. And so I don't, I don't know a whole lot in detail about that, but all of this stuff around, um, you know, playbooks and marketing and all of that is now available through ConnectWise for BDR um, too. And um, Jay is, you know, Jay Ryersey is quite proud to tell you um, the reason ConnectWise is sinking all this money into the program, and this obviously has to be expensive, is because it works and they can prove it. They can look at how the part, the 2000 partners in that program perform relative to the other program or uh, other partners. And uh, Jay said, partners in the program are growing with us between four and five X faster than the rest of our partner community in security, the other security partners that we do business with. So just very interesting. And I'll, I'll pause there and get um, Ed's experience with IT Nation Secure. But this was a lot of very new information for me. So I, I, I've got to say that ConnectWise creating this entity or division has been just such a boon for my company. Uh, we got in on the early adopter program before it was really announced. Um, absolutely fascinating. One thing you didn't mention was the training. So they have this whole thing they call certify security training. Uh, it starts out with security basics, which is free. Every employee of my company went through that. It, and it gives you the security basics, which is really good. Um, we have five employees at my company now who go to a monthly security training. And I was making some notes as you were speaking, Rich. So there's a VCSO training. There's a SecOps training. There's a sales training. Um, and it has been invaluable. So I think I've been in taking my own classes. Uh, I largely do sales. So I take the security training for sales. Uh, it's been about two and a half years I've been in it. And it's been invaluable to growing our business and selling it. The first part of this program uh, is a stage called get your house in order. It's like, okay, you can't really be accountable to be securing your clients if you're not secure yourself. Um, so just it's it's wonderful. It's a great program. I'm, I highly encourage anyone who's a ConnectWise partner, you should sign up today. I, you know, and you, you can't beat the price, right? <laughs> But the fact they have that for free is kind of kind of crazy, right? Like who who wouldn't leverage all that stuff if you're a kind well? Of there's a lot of companies that always intend to do things but never get around to it. Let me mention one more thing about the the funds that are available: the MDF or market development funds. That's seeding funds. They're going to give you cash so that you can grow your business, the mutual business between the two of you. Why wouldn't you do that? And then the co-op funds is now you've established a group of customers that are buying the, the products and you're, they're going to give you a rebate back on what you, sp uh, what you spent with ConnectWise so that you can further market and grow the business. It's like, it's a win-win. So as, as the more people take advantage of that though, do you, is the, the timelines to get deliverables from them on certain things take longer? Is it harder to get through? How does that, uh, how does that work? Uh, I haven't seen any evidence of that. What I have seen is that the program is maturing. It was pretty rough in the beginning, but I was happy to jump in there because I'll, I'll take all the help I can at growing my business. Um, but it's matured significantly over the years. Very interesting. Uh, yeah. Rich, Rich, anything else to add from ConnectWise? One uh, one quick thing. I mentioned that I interviewed Patrick Beggs, their CISO as well. And um, we spoke about, you know, he... 
th this is his first year in that job. He he is making investments in in terms of um, uh, product security, internal security uh, as well. He he's embedding people in the product groups. He's uh, in the process of creating. This will probably be a 2023 thing, but he's creating a a red team in house to just you know hack Connectwise products um, from inside and look for vulnerabilities. At, at one point in that interview, though, I asked him about something um, that we didn't actually have bandwidth to report on, um, but this is something that folks in our audience um, undoubtedly have heard about. Um, the, the, the good folks at CRN did some great reporting around this vulnerability that was quite recently found in R1Soft. R1Soft is this um, ConnectWise uh, security brand, and uh, their servers had a weakness in them that, you know, had had this not been patched up. Could have been, uh, led to very very serious consequences, and so I mean I asked about that, you know, and how that kind of ties into all the in investments around internal security. Connectwise is doing. There was no awkwardness, no embarrassment in in Patrick's response about that. He kind of smiled and basically said, "That's the system working the way it should." Now that he then went on to clarify, there was one piece of that that's an exception. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but he connectwise, they very much want people outside the company looking for vulnerabilities and then doing what happened in this case. So in this case, what happened um, is a an independent researcher, a, a white hat of some kind, found this vulnerability, um, reported it to Huntress. Uh, we know Huntress um, uh, very well. I think most folks in the audience do. Huntress reported it to connectwise, connectwise fixed it. Then word gets out to the the public. This happened. It's not an issue now, but you should know that that this happened. And from a Connectwise point of view, that's the way the system should work. So as opposed to just blasting news about a zero day out to the world, somebody did the responsible thing, reported it, allowed you know remedi remediation measures to go into effect. A fix gets. Um, uh, introduced and then there's transparency around what happened and and why and what's being changed about that. There is one piece of the story though that they are you know quick to say at Connectwise did not go the way it should have gone, and that is that this researcher who found the vulnerability in the R1 soft um, servers approached Connectwise with this discovery first and couldn't get their attention, and so at that point he goes to Huntress. Huntress then kind of validates, yep, this is a real problem. And Huntress didn't have trouble getting uh, attention over at ConnectWise and ConnectWise does what it should. And so, um, and this is something that's happening probably like this week, it may have happened last week, but ConnectWise is taking action to make it easier for people outside the company to get their attention when they find this kind of thing. And it's, um, I didn't get into it in great detail. It's basically a sort of email based hotline that they're gonna be rolling out if they haven't already that they are saying that they will really, truly, honestly be monitoring for these kinds of reports so that they're more responsive in, in uh, acting on them. And we'll see, we'll see how that works. But that that's one kind of piece of the story that they're not proud of. But for the, for the most part, rather than regard this as a black eye, they're regarding this as the way things should work in the channel, basically. We're all looking for these weaknesses and then dealing with them responsibly. It's got to be a lot of noise um, when you're when you're a big company like that, like people saying they discovered vulnerabilities, but, you know, did they really? It's got to be a lot to filter. Um, Ed, Ed, what do you think about that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I I cringe if I think about us, if I had to dedicate resources just to be fielding that kind of communication, what would it do for me? But ConnectWise has done an amazing job the last two or three years of really being much more transparent. They've even got a web page up for their partners. They're telling you about these issues. Uh, I'm proud to say that we're a Huntress partner. So, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're on every computer we manage uh, and they're alerting us. We use them as an intrusion detection system and they let us know if there's anything getting past things. So, you know, I was thinking about this earlier when we were first talking, you know, there's Kaseya and there's ConnectWise and there's all these other partners. However, it was easier to choose a vendor to partner with early and be completely within their stack. Today, it's almost impossible. So I have close to a dozen products that I get from Kaseya. I, I bought into the other companies before Kaseya bought them. Uh, our main vendor for our PSA and RMM is ConnectWise and increasingly a lot of new products. But then we have other companies that have not yet been acquired. Um, so it's it's interesting. It's it's a web, 
And you really need to build relationships with strategic vendors. And that's hard. It, it's work. It is, it is hard, uh, and, but they're always trying to make it easier. And hopefully, hopefully the partner the programs like this are, are going to be um, instrumental in helping uh, their partners grow and get better and also, you know, do the right things around security and all of those other things that we've been talking about. So really interesting. And I thank you for sharing your insights on that. Um, I, I, we could probably spend a little more time on that, but we, we're running the hair long and I want to make sure we get uh, our to our interview with Nigel, but there's one other story that we that we wanted to talk about real quick. And uh, Rich, I don't know how how much we're going to dive into some of this, but I'm sure you can give us a, a quick overview. And that's how to deliver customer experience excellence. Tell us about that. Yeah, this uh, this is the cover story from our November issue, and it's um, I, I was really pleased with the way this article came together. I think it's an important topic, and the article kind of points out. Um, uh, you know, so first of all, customer experience has become a huge part of how people decide who they're going to buy from, where they're going to buy from, how loyal they're going to be to those people. Um, you know, um, Amazon and and all of these other companies that are very good at that have set expectations that very much apply to IT and, and managed services and beyond uh, right now. And so, um, uh, you know, Stanley Lewis, um, uh, uh, an MSP who's been a guest host on this program, he, he has kind of a, a, a nice way of describing the difference between customer experience and customer service, because they're different things. Customer service is what you are doing for, what you are providing to the customer. Customer experience is how the customer feels about that, feels about doing business with you. Does it feel um, easy? Does it feel like they're well taken care of? It's, it's a different matter. And it's important because you know um, people will pay more money um, for a good customer experience and they'll they'll um, split and go to somebody else if they're getting a bad customer experience. There was a, a quote in the story that I, I liked very much from an MSP who said, price is always going to be a factor when choosing an MSP, but almost any business owner of any size prefers a frictionless relationship over saving a few dollars. And so rather, I won't get into the details, Matt, we've got a link to the story. I highly, highly recommend people read the article and some of the very specific guidance in it about what it means, how you can um, both deliver a frictionless experience that's going to be a great experience for customers um, and how just to be aware of how good a job you're doing at customer experience. It's all kind of spelled out in the article, um, but it's it's an important topic and especially because um, you know, uh, managed services and um, cloud services, there, there's an element of commoditization in those markets um, these days that, you know, wasn't there five years ago, 10 years ago. And experience is going to weigh more and more heavily on who succeeds and who doesn't um, in the market. You're really going to want to be a leader in that area. So well said. That's absolutely true. In fact, I thought the article was so good. I plan to have a special, uh, I have a leadership team that helps run the company. I plan to schedule a special leadership team where I'm going to email that article to them a week before and tell them we're going to discuss the article and what we do. Um, it always frustrates me a lot that most MSPs do not elicit information from their customers. You know, we survey after every service ticket request, and I'm very proud to say we're running about a 9.8 right now on those surveys. Once a quarter, I survey all the decision makers who sign the agreements about what was your experience last quarter? And that's on a net promoter score basis. Related to that, we also survey our employees once a quarter. To say, but if you're not tracking this, how do you know how you're doing? And then how do you improve? And I totally agree. Uh, I'd say the commoditization is more than a little part of our business. It's a vastly growing part. And you've got to keep your eye on this part of the business. It, it's important. It, it is very important. It's critical. You have, it's yeah, critical. you got you to be able to benchmark your your not only yourselves but what what your customers are feeling and 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 continue to ask over time, right? Because if if that's how you catch if things are going downhill, you catch that early, right? The best the best customers that are looking for a true partner in our industry that they're going to trust and just give money to unquestioningly because you're you're delivering on 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 the relationship. Uh, you've got to nurture that. It, it's just, it's so crucial. I'm so glad you, you guys had the article. Any Anything else in that article you wanted to, to touch on or highlight before we uh, no, switch I, I just, over to Nigel? The only thing I would say is there's a lot to learn in it. 
read it, reread it, discuss it with your leadership team. I mean, it was almost a how-to man. <laughs> no higher praise than that. So uh, kudos. Uh, kudos. Who, put, who Was that James who put that together, Rich? Yeah, it was James Gaskin. And I, I, it's worth kind of calling out. I mean, James has been with us as long, pretty much as long as there's been a channel pro. He writes lots of reviews. He does our, our uh, you know, uh, in case you missed it, roundup piece. Th this is a little different for him. Th this this kind of article, we haven't given him these kind of assignments uh, so much before. He he did a bang up job. Knocked it out of the park, it sounds like. So kudos to uh, kudos to Mr. Mr. Gaskin for that. Go and check that out. We'll put the link uh, in the in the show notes uh, at channelfornetwork.com. Make sure you go there or open up, again, the description area on your phone or on YouTube, and uh, you should find the link in there. Go check it out. Go read it. Uh, super excited. We've got an awesome interview coming up with Nigel Moore. He's the founder and CEO of the Tech Tribe. Uh, he we, we He's in Australia, so we um, had to record this a little earlier, but due to the those who are watching due to the magic of television, some of us are wearing the same clothes, so it almost looks like it's it's real time but uh we had to we had some interesting uh we had to work out the, the time differences because we're all over the world in this case so uh we were doing it at odd times but it turned out well i think you're really going to enjoy it uh lots of hair care out. tips lots of <laughs> lots of hair care tips you'll find out why we'll be right back And welcome back to part two of this episode of Channel Pro Weekly. We got Ed Correa still with us here on the other side. I'm really excited uh, for this interview. It's going to be great. And, and, and let me set it up this way. It's like no one can catch a break these days. After two years of uncertainty, fallout from the pandemic in the form of a global supply chain issues, labor shortages, economic recession has led to more of the same uncertainty. So through the IT industry and the IT channel in particular, we fared pretty well, but there's no doubt some rocky road ahead. And I'm not talking about ice cream. I'm talking about more uncertainty, difficulty, hardship, all that kind of stuff. So what can you do to survive and thrive in these uncertain times? We're here to talk about that and the importance of, of mindset is the founder and CEO of the Tech Tribe, Mr. Nigel Moore. Welcome, Nigel. Hello, and thank you for having me. It, it is great to have you on. Uh, I'm very excited. I got a chance to hear you speak in our um, business uh, management summit that we had a few months ago. For those who, who caught that, it was a great session. And I've just been dying to get you on the show uh, to talk, uh, talk to you in person and all these kinds of stuff. So I'm really excited that you're here. Um, so before we get dive in, though, I want to give you an opportunity to tell people a little bit more um, about you, a little bit more about the Tech Tribe. And I also point out that uh, you are in a vastly dif different time zone than we are. So tell us, tell us a little bit more about that. I uh, well, good day. I, I am from the other side of the world, Sydney, Australia, or just north of Sydney, Australia. Uh, my background is that I in, I started and ran an MSP for. I, I was actually working for another MSP when I first started in the tech industry for about six or seven years. Then I ran my own for about eight years. It got acquired in 2016, and in 2017 I built the Tech Tribe, which is a, an MSP program and community for to help MSPs all around the world. And um, essentially, what we do in there is teach and coach and help other MSPs to avoid all the stupid crap that I did wrong for the 15 years when I was in the industry. And we're, we've currently got about 3,500 MSPs in there, all um, learning things, doing things, creating things, building things, and uh, we help them out along the way. So, so what originally got you into being an MSP? What was kind of your background that led to that? Uh, I kind of fell into it. I was working at a radio station in the tech department and we had an MSP and um, or we worked with an MSP and that MSP poached me. And so I started working for them for about five years, five or six years. And uh, eventually through a crazy, weird, annoying, frustrating series of events, uh, one Monday morning, I woke up and had my own MSP and it wasn't overly intentional. It was just that I had $50,000 in credit card debt. I, um, I didn't have a job and I had all of these people calling me, asking me if I could help them out with their, their IT. And so my, my MSP that I owned was birthed um, out of that, not out of wanting to, to start one. I love technology and I loved helping people. And so it was the perfect ripe um right parts to create an msp but it wasn't overly intentional back then i had no no grand plans just to survive and, and put food on my table and pay off my crazy credit card debt that i'd racked up and, and have you at least gotten the credit card debt paid off by now it got down took me a few years actually <laughs> it got down it's gone and i haven't i haven't um held credit card debt in probably a decade now 12 years or something and always, i don't recommend a anybody idea does to, yeah i was gonna not to carry a lot of that if uh, if you don't have oh, yeah. to so what uh, what led to the to the creation of the tech tribe? You just decided that uh, that the MSP days are behind you, and that now you just wanted to help, or how did what kind of led to that? Yeah, good question. Um, as I was running my MSP in the last couple of years, I got to the point where 
you get to that point where you're burning out a little bit and I was burning out a little bit. So I was working incredibly hard on my MSP to extract myself out of it or extract myself out of the day-to-day runnings of it. And so I'd done a lot of that with the help desk team and a lot of the back-end operation stuff, the the finance and the accounting and the, the sales admin and all of that stuff and the ordering and quoting. And um, and when I was at events and, and whatnot, I would talk to other smaller MSPs. We were only small. We were only 10 staff or eight staff at that time. And I'm um, talking to smaller MSPs and I started helping them a little bit with uh, some of the stuff that I had done in my business. And, and I enjoyed the crap out of it, like sitting down and uh, I don't know why it was just more fun on someone else's MSP than it was on my own. And, um, and so I just started helping them with little bits and pieces that I'd done in my own. And, and that got to the point where I went, Hey, I could like, I love doing this. I don't know what that means, but I, I stumbled across a, um, a person called Jam Shramko out here in Australia, who was running a membership program, which was like a little business business program where it was teaching and coaching and creating creating training materials and everything and I thought hey maybe I can do something like that so I did a little first round of of that with a business partner whilst I had my MSP and we had a little bit of success with that but we weren't all in on it and we had we had different directions that we kind of wanted to go in but it gave me that taste of um, helping and creating training and creating resources and building a community and um and the community to me in the MSP world was so ridiculously important for my success just having that 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 group of peers that are all following the same journey and sharing the same workload as you and, and having the same challenges as you beside me um, was huge. And so I knew that I wanted to teach and coach and help people. And I knew that having a community or building a community as part of that would be one of the most amazing things I could do in the world. Just being able to, to see all these MSPs working together in a, in a community that we'd pulled together would be absolutely amazing. And so the Tech Tribe was birthed out of that. And when, when our, my MSP sold, um, it was already underway getting the, the plans for this happening and took a couple of months off as you do when you sell a business and traveled around and took the kids around and, um, and then dived headfirst into it. And the Tech Tribe was then launched officially in um, January, 2017. And, we haven't stopped since. It's been it's grown every single month since then without fail, and um, and it's still growing every month and having a world of fun. And we're still we're still making mistakes as I was making in my MSP. We're still making mistakes and we're still learning, but we're um we're we're finally cooking with gas and uh, having a bit of fun. And we've got a bunch of awesome MSPs in there and a bunch of people on the team that are doing amazing things. And we're we're just as I said to the team, we've kicked off our um our diapers and our baby diapers and we've put on some toddlers running shoes and we're starting to run as a business at the moment and it's it's getting exciting and it's and it's been very very successful i've heard many many people talk about the tech tribe before are you surprised at the the global reach that it's already gotten i am (laughs) so when i was first kicking it off my, my goal was hey i could build a a business out of this thing that could pay me X number of dollars that could help us just su- survive as a family. We made, we made some money out of the, the business sale, but it wasn't retirement forever money. It wasn't um, that we, we still had to go and build another business after that. And so um, we, we were lucky that um, the first couple of years, we didn't have to take any money from the tech tribe. So we're able to just focus on on 100% working on it and and work with the money that we we had or invest the money that we had from the other thing. And, and my goal was to get it to the point where it was, it was made a sustainable living for us so that I could then go out and build a, a bigger, bigger business. To me, I, I, I didn't see the bigger vision of it just yet. I had a vision of, of maybe 500 people in this business and we were teaching them and coaching them and it was doing X number of dollars. And, and that would give me a little bit of space to go and build a bigger, bigger business out there. That would be the more the, the retirement one and the, um, the one that, that would have the bigger impact. But uh, lo and behold, the tech tribe started to get to this point, probably at the two year mark where it just started to, to, to take off. And I went, hang on, maybe I need to expand my vision here rather than going and finding somewhere else to, to go and do it. And so, uh, the last couple of years have been that just, just trying to, to, to keep up with demand and, um, and expand that vision to, to take advantage of the opportunity out there and to, to help and serve all the, the MSPs that really need a bunch of help out there. And, the, the more, the deeper we get in the MSP space, the the more we see the patterns that, that are familiar across every MSP with their struggles and their challenges. And that means the more, the more um, fodder that we've got to be able to create amazing things for them to help them through all those challenges. And so we just, our, all we do now is just work our little rear ends off and our little tails off on trying to create training and resources and workshops and, and give marketing stuff and whatever it happens to be to, to help them better run and grow their MSP and get through all the crazy challenges that are, that, that most MSPs are facing out there. 
Well, that's absolutely amazing. I'm glad it's uh, it's it's becoming way more successful than you uh, than you ever dreamed. And I think I, I, I speak for anyone who's watching on YouTube uh, that we have one more really, really important question to ask. And one of the things that you've kind of become known for the last couple of years is I've seen you as this uh, this giant lock of long, long uh, hair that you've got <laughs> coming under, underneath that uh, that baseball cap. So I have to ask the million dollar question. Uh, what kind of conditioner do you use and how long does it take? Uh, the ocean. And that's about it. <laughs> so, I, I very, very rarely wash my hair. I don't do it. That's why it looks like a, a, a homeless person and is full of dreadlocks and horrible and dry and probably breaking in parts. And and like the most it gets is, is drying out from salt water in the ocean when I'm surfing. Um, my wife would want me to keep throwing conditioner in it, but um, I don't listen very well. <laughs> Well, at least at least you get to use the ocean as your bathtub uh, out here yeah. in the Midwest. Uh, I don't really get that particular uh, option. Rich, do you use the ocean as your your bathtub or do you um, do you find that uh, you're just not at home enough to, to go dipping into the into the Pacific? <laughs> yeah, it, I, I'm, uh, I'm looking for bird baths all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Rich, is, Rich is looking for bird baths. Rich is also still on hotel Wi-Fi, folks. So uh, we might we might lose him uh, here and there. Ed, are you a are you a swim in the ocean kind of guy? uh when i'm on vacation absolutely oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah we are what's your are what's your lucky preferred... to have the ocean out the front yeah here what's your and... what's your preferred ocean uh mine oh i don't no i don't think i really mind uh my wife's preferred ocean is the caribbean so i think it's about eight seven or eight weeks we're headed down to cancun and uh mm. can't wait awesome awesome well <laughs> Not that uh, I'm have fun on that today. vacation <laughs> <laughs> very cool so rich um when you're not uh, when you're not uh, uh, diving into bird baths to try to get your hair wet, uh, we are thinking about things that we can we can do to help our audience understand these crazy uncertain times. So why don't you kind of set up this discussion and uh, tell us where we what we want to ask Nigel? Yeah, so um, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, Nigel, um, right at the beginning of uh, of COVID, um, you published a book called "Survive and Thrive," and it was about you know recommendations you had for MSPs about how to prepare for the the unknown and and uh, what we were headed into uh, in that time. Thankfully, most of that ordeal is behind us right now. But I, the reason I'm in a hotel room with terrible Wi-Fi is because I'm attending. A, a TD Cinex uh, event in Orlando this week. And um, this morning, actually, um, in the keynotes, you know, Rich Hume, the, the CEO of the other executives were basically saying, um, we don't even know, like, nobody knows what to expect in 2023, um, basically. And so it does kind of put um, our audience at Channel Pro back in the, the position of looking ahead and thinking, could be a recession, could be a small one, could be a big one. Maybe we get lucky and it doesn't happen. What do I do now to prepare? This topic has been coming up a lot in conversation. So, um, you know, I, I'll just kind of set it up that way. If you were advising, um, you know, MSPs and the tech tribe folks who are in the audience here right now, what do you do now, um, given that we know there, there could be some difficult times coming up in the future, but we're not actually in those difficult times now. Yeah, it's a, a tough thing to, like, none of us can speculate exactly what's going to happen. And I, I don't think that's the, comp the part for this conversation. But to me, going through any crazy time, like COVID or um, recession or whatever it happens to be, even a, a crazy time just in your own particular business, like we were talking about this off air beforehand, to me, a lot of being able to get through crazy situations is having your your, your mind and your brain and your, your personal space in the right spot and and for me many years ago when i was going through my my own personal madness part of my msp journey um, my my mind was in the absolute wrong spot and i was i was not helping that i was i was drinking like crazy i was having i was no zero exercise i wasn't getting outside i was literally sitting in front of a computer just dealing with stressful stuff all day every day and seeing stressful stuff all day every day my eyes were glued to the news just because um, i needed those quick dopamine hits and that was fueling all of this craziness in my world and that became this echo chamber of madness and this echo chamber of of bad stuff and it it, they, at that point in time, there wasn't even bad stuff happening. Like we weren't in the middle of the, the, the 08 financial crisis. We weren't in the middle of anything, but all this, me focusing on the media and focusing on all this, this madness just drove me into this horrible hole. And that meant that it was really hard for me to get through that phase in my, my business, like horribly hard because I was waking up every morning, hating life and hating my business and hating everything that I'd built. And so for me, one of the things that, that 
I always encourage people to focus on is their own mental health and their own mental well-being. No matter whether we're in a recessionary crazy period, we're in a, a or in anything, just focus on being comfortable and happy about where you are outside of business and outside of, of all of this stuff uh, first. So that if you are going through a crazy challenging time, whether be that recession, be that pandemic, be that whatever it is, at least you've got, you wake up every day feeling comfortable in your own skin. And that to me is, is wildly important. Sometimes um, that's not possible to do yourself. Sometimes it takes medication. Sometimes it takes, if we're, we, we're particularly challenged, sometimes it takes going to therapy or going and calling on some professional help out there. And, and we're lucky that in the last four or five or six years, the whole um, notion of going to therapy has lost its stigma. And, and I think it's losing a stigma more and more and more. And so to me, number one, going through all that stuff is just focus on your own mind and your own mental health and, and just make sure that you're in, in a state to be able to get through a challenge. Because if you're not, you're going to really struggle. And if you're looking at things like the news all day, every day, trying to, to keep up with all the craziness that's happening, that's just going to keep you in this echo chamber of, of, of recessionary news and, and all this sort of stuff. And, and the reality is when you think about it, and, and I don't want to, um, talk light of a recession. A recession is a serious thing for an economy. However, when you talk about it, it's really only a, a minor percentage drop compared to normal GDP growth. And, and it's not it's not like the, the, the bottom drops out of a market. Typically, you don't lose 90, 80, 90% 90 in there. You're losing 5, 10, 15, 20% sometimes, maybe a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less through a, a period. But um, it's, it's often nowhere near as bad as the media will play it out to be. And as often, you guys would know that there's a media outlets out there that would love to beat it up as if the world's ending. And it's not, it's just a slow period. Every, like the way I see recessionary periods is um, that they also have a, a, a silver lining in that they get rid of lots of the guff that have come into the marketplace that, that doesn't have a spot in the marketplace. All the, the bad players that have turned up that have got no idea what they're doing and they, they don't care about their clients and they're just billing their billing stuff willy nilly, they get churned out in a, in a recession and, and the good guys and the good girls and the good players that, that are focused on their staff and are focused on a good mission and are focused on looking after their clients really, really well. They're the ones that come out the other side, really primed to take advantage of the next bull run whenever that happens to be. And so, so yes, sometimes it's challenging going through, especially if you're leveraged, leveraged up, but, um, but you just got to, to me, focus on this, focus on there being a, a five, 10 year vision for yourself, not a, not a, three months six month vision for yourself and and it certainly helps make things hard uh easier as you go through it well i i should say um you know we we've got a, a story on the editorial calendar for 2023 about um mental health in in the channel taking care of uh of yourself uh that way we've written an article in the recent past about physical health i don't think we talk enough in the channel about you know and and there's a lot of stress and uh, so there are a lot of reasons why that really is an important topic. And I want to kind of come back to um, something related to that, which Matt was kind of hinting at, which is this whole kind of mindset issue. But um, but it, it sounds like just in terms of, um, you know, preparing, because everyone is, is thinking, do, do I need to do something different to get myself ready for a recession? It sounds to me like you're, you're basically saying, if you've got the fundamentals right and you have a long-term vision and you're you're running the business in an effective way, you you almost don't want to overcorrect for what could be coming mm -hmm. right now. Stay focused yeah. on the the long term as opposed to uh, uh, the short term. Keep your keep your eyes on the long term, but be ready to make quick quick sharp moves in the short term. That's the the key that I always find in business is keep that long term vision bouncing in your head so that you've got something bigger to tie onto. But but be very prepared and very ready to make short sharp moves. And those short sharp moves might be uncomfortable. Sometimes you might have to reduce some team size in there if you do lose a, a particular client or two or three in there, uh, or if clients spend less. One like in in this book, and I I I've got to admit I've got to go and read it myself again because I wrote it two years ago now, and um and I don't remember everything that I wrote in it. But just having a look through the um through the table of contents here, I was as I was doing beforehand, is that we run through things like like um making sure that your accounts receivable are in check. There's, there's no, like so many times I speak to MSPs and we talk about cash flow and we talk about them not having the money to do this or not having the money to do that. And, and I bring up the topic of accounts receivable and I talk, and I find out how that is at. And so many MSPs are sitting at like 20, 30% of their revenue sitting in, in outstanding accounts receivable. And they've got their average debtor day sitting at 45, 55 days. Now I'm going to admit that I was the first to have exactly that in my MSP uh, many years ago as well. But um, I had a couple of scares that, that nearly sent me out of business where some, some very long-term, very most loved, very stable clients went out of business overnight like that. 
and um, they owed me lots of money. And so I, I had one of those times where I had to go and make some changes. And I, I made changes. And one of those changes was a decision to not offer credit to our clients. We decided that we're not a bank. We want to be an amazing, awesome, expert level IT support and so structure for your business, but we can't be your bank. And so if you want terms and you want you want us to float you some credit, uh, we sorry, but we can't do that. We want to be here for you tomorrow and the day after and the day after. And so we'll happily work with your finance company or whoever it happens to be to, to help you guys get some credit, but we can't be that credit. And so to me, that's now is another opportune time. If you're running a lot of credit on your books out there and it's, and it's becoming a weight on your business, now's an opportune time time to start making those changes really quickly and, and start reducing credit terms or reducing, um, getting rid of credit completely, giving prepaid, if you're still doing the old break fix world, doing some, some switching contracts all across to prepaid rather than postpaid uh, break fix and and making sure that your, your your managed service agreements are all automatically billed, automatically pinged on the, the before that the month actually starts, um, so that all the money sitting in your account and switching projects and hardware and and resale revenue across to prepaid, and that was a, a tough one for us in our business uh, because I had been working for the other MSP for for five or six years and then I'd been running my own for a couple of years when we got to that point, and so our clients had this crazy expectation that we just float whatever sort of credit we ever needed to give them. And we'd, we'd build things sometimes months in arrears. And, um, and to switch that across to billing everything up front, including projects, including everything up front, uh, was a big monumental shift for a lot of our clients to take in. But I led with the story and the stories were that we knew we were this close to going out of business. I was this close to going bankrupt. And if I did that, then you wouldn't have us as your IT company anymore. And so I, I, whilst I would love to offer credit, I'm crap at being a banker. Like I've made some bad decisions. I, I'm not good at banking. I don't get it. And so I just want to operate as your IT person and in your IT company and, and let us do that and we'll do it well, but we just need to make sure that we've got the cash in advance to be able to, to float that for you. And, and those conversations and leading with that story really helped with that, that shift with all of our clients. And I think we only had one client give us a tiny little bit of pushback through that, that six to 12 month journey. Uh, outside of that, everybody else just just listened to the story and, and fully understood and, and went, went about it in their merry way. And we, we, we got from um, having something like 30% of our revenue sitting in our uh, open accounts receivable balance to having something like 3%. Um, and our average debtor days went from that 45 days down to, I think it was six. Um, with 3% of revenue in there. And that was over about a 12 to 18 month period. And um, and then we ran four or five years after that, perfectly okay with with um, loads. Like we never, ever, ever, ever had a cash flow problem after that. And, and that's just one of the, the tiny little things that, that every MSP, if you are floating credit, can start that process now. And it's scary to start off with. Don't get me wrong, it's scary. But um, you'll find that if you've got a great relationship with your clients and you lead with the story that you you really want to be here and sustainable for them, then then they will all understand. So Ed, I, I, I want to bring you into the conversation to see, do you, do you operate in the same way or do you, are you oh, a bank absolutely. for your customers? You know, um, uh, first I wanted to volunteer that community is so important to us. Um, I can still, we started my company in 2000. Uh, we helped, I was a co-founder of Bass Bits, uh, the Bay Area Small Business Information Technology Specialist. Awesome. Um, and uh, Bass Bits was essential hearing from the other peers about what people were doing right or what were they were doing wrong. And I basically stole all the good ideas and tried to apply them <laughs> to my company. Um, and I, I must admit in shame, uh, it was many years before I got a hold of our finances. I can still remember the days where certain select accounts were 90, 100 days out of date um, and they were pulling my company down. Um, today, I'm proud to say that our DSO or the uh, day's sales outstanding on average, how long it takes to get paid, we're about 11 days. Um, yeah, I'd like it to be shorter because my goal is to have it less than 10. Um, but Nigel is totally right. You've got to be all over that. And, you know, for those customers who want financing, you know, I've got a relationship with Great America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can introduce them to that. But I am not a bank. I need to be paid. My people need to be paid so we can support the client. Um, I guess you know if you if you want customers to use you as a bank, just tell them like, why don't you just take all close all your regular bank accounts, give me all of your money, and just let me <laughs> use that to operate my business uh, while while I service you. That that works. Uh, banking is too regulated. I wouldn't want to be in that business. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> You know, as, as you're talking about short, sharp changes and, and accounts receivables specifically. So last week I was at 
um, the ConnectWise uh, IT Nation Connect event. Very uh, late in the show, I had a chance to interview Jason McGee, ConnectWise, the CEO, and we were talking about this, this topic, and he said he has what he calls a trigger report that he keeps an eye on. So, you know, it's not like they're changing direction in anticipation of anything, but he has a trigger report he looks at, and there's something like 10 variables or metrics on it that he's keeping an eye on, one of which is um, average uh, uh, days elapsed before accounts receivable get paid off. If, if that starts to slip and people are kind of delaying, you know, how quickly they pay ConnectWise, that's a sign that there might be uh, trouble coming up. So, I mean, are, are there are, are there triggers um, that you would um, maybe advise people to keep an eye on that could necessitate a short, sharp change? Is that me directed at me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's that's awesome. Like uh, in our MSP, we had um, a, a similar thing that was the, the cash flow report that also had those those average debtor days and everything on it. And that cash flow report was a measure of short flow, ca uh, short term cash. And um, and it showed us and I'm guessing Jason sees this as well, but it showed us not just snapshots, but trends. And so we used to pull this data out of our accounting system every single week. And my, my finance person used to give me that report every Monday morning uh, that showed available cash, average debtor days, all of these different metrics that were on there, but not just as like, it wasn't just a single yellow report with um, with the numbers on there. We used to graph it so that we saw everything as a historical trend. So we could spot when things are heading in a bad direction. And I think to for most people, that's the most important thing. They'll often look at a an average debtor day or an account receivable balance or any of these metrics, we even it might be a sales thing that they're using as their trigger, like number of, of deals being closed or number of leads turning up or whatever, which can also form a part of a, a trigger for negative stuff when you start to notice slowdowns on the top of the line um, figures in your business. But um, but but our whole goal was to spot not not to see the the numbers just on their own, but to see them in trending trending capacity in there, so that we could spot cash flow issues or we could spot issues with sales slowing down or whatever it happened to be, um, pretty pretty quickly rather than trying to just wait for it to happen out there. And so I yep. think th those ones that we just spoke about, then those numbers we spoke about, then are, are ones absolutely you should have in some sort of whether you call it a trigger report or a, a monthly cash flow or a weekly executive report or whatever it happens to be, definitely get them in there. You know, Nigel, uh, one of the things that I, I think everybody listening to this should do is look at your book of business, look at your clients, ask yourself which clients could be negatively impacted if we go into a recession. Mm, yeah. And personally, I don't think it's an if, I think we're going to go there. But, yeah. you know, which ones are operating a discretionary business that the tap could be turned off by the economy and they wouldn't be able to pay you? You need yeah. to understand which clients those are and anticipate. Yep, a thousand percent. And um, I, I often like, people always talk about um, there's riches in the niches. I think is the way you guys talk about it over there, and or riches in the niches as we say it over here. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of MSPs that have gone down the route of picking a particular niche or a vertical or two or three out there. And and we often talk about the the pros and the cons of that because it's not always rainbow and unicorns on on picking a a, a niche because as you say Ed there's there's verticals out there that, that are like discretionary spending and and sometimes even the luxury good stuff or the the whatever that that can get hit very hard in in even the pandemic or in a recessionary period and there's other things other industries out there that thrive in situations like that um, I'll use an extreme example of a, a receivership company like a, a a firm like a CPA firm or whatever that focuses focuses on receivership. Those firms go gangbusters in pandemics and recessions because there are so many businesses going out of business that they are they are in business like crazy. And so if you happen to be an MSP that's looking after receivership firms or bankruptcy firms and consulting firms, you, you will be doing very well in those periods. Um, whereas on the flip side, like the restaurant industry copped or the, the entire hospitality industry copped an absolute beating through the last two years. And, and they will, if, if we, if, as you say, Ed, we're very likely heading into a recessionary period. Um, they will very likely copper beating again through that period. And so if you're, you're very optimal or if you, you're very top heavy in, in looking after the hospitality industry, you've got to, you've got to start to make some, some, either some moves now or have some of those trigger things in place so that you're ready to make some short, sharp moves as you spot things to changing in there really quickly. And, and it's vitally important. It's, it's gonna, you've got to be ready to make those quick, sharp decisions. And I think business, the, the more, the longer I go in, in business, the more I realize the power of sharp, quick, 
informed decision making is in our business and and by informed i mean we need to have the actual data to make the right decisions and that comes down to those reports whether it's a trigger report or your cash flows or you're, you're analyzing your, your sales numbers or whatever it happens to be one you've got to make sure that if you are monitoring all them it's all good and well but then you've got to be ready to make that quick decision and that's that's often the hardest part of all and that that comes to me back to that mindset thing if you've got your mindset in place and you're you're operating from a place of 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 performance and abundance and whatever it happens to be those decisions uh, can be often uh, makes that decision making process much, much, much easier when you get there versus sometimes I've been in spaces where I've been all up messed up in the head and not not knowing which way to go. And I, I rest on these decisions that I know I need to make for for days and months and we, or, uh, months and, and, and long, long, long periods of time. And, and it backfires every single time. And it's because I, my, I didn't have my mind in the right space to, to pull the trigger on these decisions as quick as I should have. Speaking yeah. of decisions, hopefully the people listening uh, used this year to raise rates because yeah. oh, yeah. you haven't raised rates and then you cannot really do it during a recession. I mean, uh, we raised rates on all clients on their anniversary dates as the year progressed. So we're all done. Um, you'd be behind the eight ball if you wanted to do that or needed to do that during a recession. If you haven't, do it now, please, because you've just lost. Yeah. What, what, your, what's your um your inflation numbers over there at nearly ten percent, right? In the last yeah, yeah. year, and, and, and we gave we, given a ten percent discount. Every, yeah, we gave every employee a cost of living adjustment equal yeah. to to the inflation rate we were seeing. Uh, that was expensive, but yeah. frankly, yeah. you know, our most valuable resources are people. You got to protect the people. Yeah, hundred percent. No, I would say that we're still. You you haven't missed the gate right now. I, I'm still. It's still. I believe you're going to have very little pushback, if any, at the moment. If you haven't gone out and given rate rises to your clients, you, you're not going to have much pushback now because everybody's got the expectation now. Inflation, the numbers are true. The numbers are there. Uh, it's high, and and many, 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 many businesses have put up their rates. Most businesses now have come to expect it. So I don't think you've missed the gate, but if you haven't done anything, hurry up. We've, we've run a, a little member mission across our, our community and we've given them a bunch of email scripts and all sorts of stuff to go out and do exactly that and go out and raise the rates. And, and conversely, on the flip side, as Ed says, go on and flow that down to your team because if you want to get through a tough period, you ain't going to do it alone. You're going to need your team around you. And, and the more you can... Uh, when the pandemic started, I, I remember seeing um, an amazing MSP out here, um, James, who runs a, an MSP called Extreme Networks. And and when the whole pandemic started happening, like, there was just so much um, of people not knowing what's happening. Like just people looking around the world going, oh, crap, am I going to lose my job, my business, my my everything, my life? My I'm not going to be able to pay my food and whatever. And so the people that can go out and can um, can show confidence and, or can at least show leadership and can show a, a common cause that we're all going to fight against. They're going to be the ones that everybody rallies around. And so he, like, I remember seeing some of his things with his team where he sat the entire team down uh, right at the very beginning and said, crap is hitting the fan. Like there, there's no two ways about it. Crap is hitting the fan. And, and we're not going to put our heads in the sand and see if we can get through this. We are going to fight. And our number one fight is to come out of this with every single one of you in a job. That's my number one goal in this business. And to me, that's that's a rally cry for your team, right? If you if your team know that you have got their back through through a craziness in there, and and even if you come out the other side and it didn't happen, at least they know that you you had the best intention in going in there, and you, you fought tooth and nail for that to be the, the the outcome in there. And so I think if you're going into any period like this, I know when when the pandemic again first started happening, um, and I'm going to keep going back to that because there's probably going to be a lot of parallels with what happens now in terms of people's minds and, and and the uncertainty that's going on. But I remember immediately, even when banking started having some some wobbles in there, I went, oh crap, banking's having wobbles. My team are probably going to be worried about money. I'm going to pay them some months in advance. And I just threw everybody months in advance, like every single person we paid months in advance so that they knew that if banking had wobbles, if finance had wobbles, we've got a distributed team all around the world. I didn't know whether I was going to be able to pay them next month because all this craziness was happening. And so we went in and just made those things. And that meant that the team knew that we were looking after them. And I, I honestly did care like crazy about making sure that they weren't worried through this process, because if they're not worried, then then they can show up to work every day and help our clients who are worried in there. And that's that's what we did. And I think if you even now is a, a perfect time to sit with your team and, and just talk to them about it, have open dialogue about 
the, the, the world is in a wobble state at the moment. No one knows what's coming. We've, we've got no real precedence to rest on here. Uh, the best we're going to like, our goal here is to A, B, and C, is to A, keep keep you all in jobs, B, keep all of our clients, C, help our clients succeed, and, and D, well, C probably should be keep all our clients safe because we've also got the added risk of the cybersecurity um, craziness going on at the exact same time as, as eco economic wobbles out there. And so I think just that communication with your team is absolutely paramount. And then that communication should then obviously flow out to clients as well and keeping them up to date, even if it's a, a once a month um, video that you reply or that you record and send out to everybody or a, a once a month, uh, just a, a little, not, not a typical newsletter that you'll send, but just a once a month of state of the nation or state of our company or state of what's going on, just to keep your clients in the loop so that they feel a little bit of normalcy and, and confidence that, that you're there for them and the team's there for them and that, that everything is, is going as per normal and, um, and you'll do whatever it takes to keep them going as per normal through whatever might happen out there. You know, Nigel, I, I want to circle back to where we started um, because and it's come up at several points in the conversation here. I think a lot of people, when they contemplate working um, with a, a consultant, an expert like yourself, they, they think they're going to be talking mostly about operational processes and tools and so on. And I'm sure folks in the tech tribe get plenty of, of great guidance about that. But a lot I know of what you like to talk um, with MSPs about revolves around this whole um, area of mindset. And so in our, our remaining minutes here, I mean, just tell folks a little bit about what, what you mean when you think mindset and, and uh, an MSP's mindset, what, what do you have in mind and why is that so fundamental um, to success in, in this business? Yeah, good question. Deep question. Uh, and it's, and the, sometimes we we see mindset as this whole woo-woo thing, like ah, mindset, like it's probably Tony Robbins is going to come up on screen and start barking at us in a minute about something. And and the reality is it's, it's, the, that's probably part of it. Like that's, that's it. But um, like any good business and any strong leader or anybody out there doing good things has always got, got like making sure that they're looking after themselves up in their, their minds first and making sure that they're keeping their mental health in check and their, their, um, their, their goals and dreams and visions and ideas and aspirations and everything in check in there. And, and I think, as I said earlier, I kind of going to iterate on it is that uh, you, you, probably all heard of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Where we've always got our, our, like every human has got this, this level of needs that we go through before we get up to the top where we're caring about others and stuff like that, right? Right down the bottom, we care about food and water. And then we start moving our way through that list until we start caring about others up the top. And the same, the, to, to me, in, in our business, we've also got this hierarchy of things that happen in a business. And to me, any strong, good business out there needs to start with the owner or the owners or the management or the leadership or whatever it happens to be that, that's running that business business in a good mental space so that they're they're bringing a good mental space to the the functional um and the, the foundation of the business and then you can start stacking things on top like procedures and sops and teams and hiring and sales and all that sort of stuff stacks on top but to me it's it's the everything else all of those things don't work unless there is there is clarity underneath like clarity in mind and clarity in vision and and that you're looking after yourself and as i said or as you said rich before our industry is brutal sometimes. Our industry can be really tough, like really, really, really tough. And, and the number of MSPs that I've seen that have had serious mental health issues in like I've, I've I ended up being diagnosed with, with depression as I went through my mental health journey at a certain stage. And, and in the tech trial, we have lost a couple of members to mental health and, um, and it's devastating seeing that happen and seeing it to their teams and their families. And, and it's because our industry is, is a very brutal industry. We, we all love it because we all love technology and we love helping people, but all the, the stuff outside of that is, is crazy. And so, um, I see it so often that, that MSPs have been just churning at the grindstone for years and years and years and, and have been stuck at either a plateau or whatever it is. And that's eaten away and eaten away and eaten away at their, their dreams and their visions and their goals and everything to the point where they, they it shows up as mental health challenges, whether it's depression or anxiety or whatever it happens to be. And it shows up as these, these things. And, and because we're, we're, it's unfortunate we're, we're typically a male dominated industry and hopefully that changes over the years, but, but us guys tip predominantly don't like asking for help out there. Or we, we traditionally haven't liked asking for help because it's a sign of, of weakness out there. And we're, to me, it's, we're very, very, very lucky that the conversations 
um, have been more and more and more flowing around that whole mental health state and that, that it's okay to not be well and it's okay to ask for help over the last four or five or six years so that people are asking for help out there. And I've seen numbers of, of MSPs and there's been numbers of conversations in our community where uh, the owners have been in this state and then they, they, they're, they're okay with reaching out. They're okay and they, they'll share their journey with others in, in the community. And as you said, Ed, that community component is is like the key of the whole lot, making sure that you're sharing the journey with people that are okay, knowing that, that, that you can lean on if you're not okay and they're okay to, to lean on you when when they're not in a good space as well. And and that that I remember it was 2007, I think it was, that um, that I first got exposed to the MSP community as a whole. And it was in an organization out here in Australia called, originally called the SBS user groups because it was all around small business server. And, um, and then it morphed into SMB IT professionals out here. And, and that was, that was my first foray into that, that world. And that was as I was going through those mental health challenges. And so I, I didn't know that there was anybody else in our industry whatsoever. I didn't, I was naive and young and dumb and, and didn't have a, these were all competitors. I didn't know there was anybody out there that would be happy talking to me and let alone sharing the journey and, and catching up for beers and talking about all the craziness that, that went along and, and helping each other out. And that, that opened my eyes like you you wouldn't believe. And, and Ed, I'm sure you went through the exact same process of holy crap, like there's this entire ecosystem here of people willing to to help and serve. And and that's that's another big impetus for starting the tech tribe is that I know the power of community is phenomenal. And as we go through these periods here, one of the number one things you could do is lean on your community. I don't care whether it's tech tribe, HTG. Um, TBG, IT Nation Evolve, um, ASCII over in the US, you've got um, Network Group over in the UK, out here in Australia, you've got SMB IT Pro. There is so many amazing communities that if you're not in multiple ones, get yourself into multiple ones and share this, this potentially crazy period with people beside you and with people below you on the job, behind you on the journey that you can help and lift up and, and pull up and, and people in front of you on the journey that can help pull you along in there. And, um, and to me, it's, it's such a vital, vital, vital part in there because it's all like the, the healthier we're, we've got our mental space and the healthier we, the more we feel support and the more we've got support around us, the more our team are then going to feel support and the more our team are then going to support our clients and the more the, our clients are going to support their clients and becomes this, this kind of, um, the, the more positive energy we put into the whole thing, the more positive energy we get out of the whole, the whole flywheel. Yeah. And I'd love to give you a, a chance to respond to that. I, I love everything Nigel's saying. I mean, my quite brand, honestly, right? quite honest, as long as I'd like to think I'm brilliant and smart and I came up with a lot of unique ideas, I didn't. Um, I've <laughs> never seen anyone with a truly unique idea. Maybe Bob didn't know what Ted was thinking, but you go into these communities and we're sharing things. It's like open the kimono, share. You're going to find out that everybody's going through the same challenges. Everybody's got the, the same ideas. Um, but you can advance your business a lot quicker with these communities and you can survive the trials and tribulations much easier if you're in there. I honestly don't think I'd be still in business. I certainly wouldn't be succeeding the way I am if I had not joined multiple communities over my 23 years of owning Segeza. It's it, it really is great advice, and it really does put a, a, a highlight on the importance of mental health. and And I think one of the big things to say is like there's lots of ways to deal with with stress, and there's lots of ways to to work on your mental health. But everything always seems worse and unachievable and impossible when you're alone, right? And that's why when you're talking about being involved in peer groups and get, uh, being involved in um, you know, all of these different organizations, it's just so you're not alone, right? And sometimes you just need that to start yeah. getting over the hump. So yeah. very important stuff. Nigel, uh, great conversation. Unfortunately, I know we're starting to run short on time. I really appreciate you coming on and talking about it. And I, and I, I really don't think that the, the, we, we got a lot ahead in terms of uncertainty. And I know we're going to be talking mm -hmm. about a lot about stuff like this on the show uh, over the next couple of years. Um, I know and the mental health discussion is not going away, especially at times like this, when, when there is just a incredibly high levels of stress. Um, so I, I almost guarantee that you're going to be back with us at some point talking a little <laughs> bit more about these topics to. and others. Um, but for, for, for those um, who want to learn more about the Tech Tribe, learn more about you, connect with you, uh, where can they go? Uh, where can they find you? Uh, just head to the techtribe.com is the easiest, the techtribe.com. Uh, you'll find out what we do there and and um, all the craziness that we we do in that on that website. I was going to mention, we didn't talk about this beforehand, but we did talk about that book that I, I wrote. It, 
if anybody wants a copy of that, um, do you want me to like, I'm happy to give anybody digital copies um, for free hundred percent. So Rich, do you, do you want them to send you guys something to ask for it or how do you like, we, I can just send the PDF to anybody that wants to read it. It's a short read. You'll get through it in kind of 60 minutes, but it's full of 90% of it is going to be relevant to a recession and 10% of it's not because it's pandemic related. Cause I, wrote I will let you there. decide. Uh, we, we, we can, we can open up our email address podcast at channel for if you'd like to get a copy of the book, okay. but uh, Nigel, if you'd like to field those requests directly yourself, yeah, kind of get to know who's reading it. They're welcome to email me. I am this rude, arrogant guy who doesn't do email very well. Um, and so if you do email me, you're going to get a weird out of office <laughs> reply back that says I've declared email bankruptcy. Um, but my team managed my inbox for me. So if you want to email me, Nigel at the tech and you want to copy this book, just shoot me an email and um, let us know. And we'll, the, the guys on the team will see that you can ignore the out of office reply they will reply back to you with a copy of the book um and hopefully it helps you it's very generous of you really appreciate it so uh, i hope uh, people take advantage of that and uh, and give that a a read in fact i'm going to send an email myself i would like to uh to read that one myself i will uh, send with, you one myself that would be wonderful i would really mm -hmm. appreciate that uh and with that we're going to say mm -hmm. goodbye to nigel thank you so much for being on can't wait to have you back we're going to take a short break when we come back ed will still be with us on the other side we're going to break down the 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 show talk about this interview this awesome interview we had and probably have a little bit of fun as well in channel pro weekly style what are we going to do i have no idea that's why you got to stay tuned to find out so we'll see you on the other side we'll be right back <laughs> And we're back now with part three of this episode of Channel Pro Weekly. I have to say, N Nigel is one of the most dynamic, interesting characters that I've ever met. Like he, I could listen to that guy talk nonstop. I, I don't know if it's the accent. I don't know if it's, if it's the fact that he's super smart or if, if he's just because he's fun and, and dynamic, like whatever it is, that was a, a great, great interview. And I'm so happy Nigel was able to come on and join us. I just, I knew that was going to be a, a real treat for the audience. Uh, I'll, I'll, Ed, what did you think? I'll, I'll let you. I, you know, I, one thing comes to mind. Um, most of our brains operate faster than we can speak, but Nigel talks so fast. How fast is his brain? <laughs> <laughs> and and you know what, Matt, before we went into that um, segment, Matt, you, you pointed out that timing, you know, is kind of an issue when you're having somebody from Australia on onto the show. There, there really is this very kind of narrow window on the on the calendar that works for everybody. And um, it was 8 a.m. where he, I can't remember if this comes up in the interview or not, because um, we're recording this part a few days later. It was 8 a.m. where he was. Can you imagine how fast he talks at 10 a.m.? <laughs> right. I'd be afraid to give that guy an espresso. Like, but, but, but it was it was a constant stream of thoughts that were well connected. Yeah. He didn't pause at any moment to go. Hmm, let me think about that. He just go go. A good. I am so so outclassed. <laughs> Uh, and, and, but but it was also great great information too. I mean, a lot He's lot a of love smart really. smart guy. He is, he is. And I, I cannot wait uh, to get him back on to talk about other things because he's he's very well versed in all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, he was talking about that book, stuff. Survive and Thrive, and he's he's saying he couldn't remember it. Uh, <laughs> after we recorded that bit, I went immediately downloaded the Kindle version and I'm going, oh my God, this is a great recipe for what we're about to go into. Fascinating. So yeah, yeah, I can't wait to get my hand. So uh, folks, uh, he did offer, a, if anybody wants to take advantage of it, he'll we'll send you a copy of that, of a, a digital copy of that book. Uh, take advantage of that. I can't wait to get my hands on it and, and give that a read as well. I think it's going to be really, really good. So big thanks to Nigel for coming on. Uh, just awesome stuff. And um, Rich, I'm sure, I'm sure we'll get him back down uh, on the show somewhere down the road. Uh, somehow Rich makes magic things happen. I think he can make that happen again. Speaking of magic, there is no, there is no other magic meal than thanksgiving and we're gonna have uh we're, we're coming up on the thanksgiving week so reminder folks there will not be a show next week it is the thanksgiving holiday rich and i are taking a week off uh to uh spend time with uh friends and family and i actually rich i didn't really ask you what you're doing for thanksgiving i should i'll, I'll find out when we're done um but uh i think we're gonna have a little fun with ed and we're gonna play a game of verses what are we gonna what are we gonna do rich well, this is this is really, uh, you know, it, it's essentially our Thanksgiving show, right? Because we're taking the Thanksgiving week off. So uh, as folks know, we've uh, the, our, our latest, our newest game to play with guest hosts is we we force them basically to pick one of two good things. And then the winner of that round advances to the next one. And what better thing to do um, this week than to play a round of verses about Thanksgiving food? 
Uh, and it, it it is, I don't know about you, Ed, Thanksgiving is like, Thanksgiving food is just like one of my all time favorites. Like I always look forward to this every year. And, you know, I, I also, but before we dive into this, are you a, are, are you, are you a Thanksgiving fan, Ed? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Are you a, are you can only have turkey at Thanksgiving kind of person? Or do you find no, that you, no. you have turkey I, year I, round? I, after after every Thanksgiving, I tell my wife, I said, well, can't we have this more often? Maybe let's have this for New Year's. Let's find other other times where we can do this. It's a lot of work, but boy, is it good. It, it is good. And you know, like I because I, I've had people tell me that they're like, well, I, I look forward to Thanksgiving because it's the one time a year I have turkey. And I'm I'm looking at them like you can have you turkey can... anytime. Yes, right? yes. And my yes. wife and I will brine and we'll we'll smoke those things and we'll just eat on it for like a week with, with the family. We'll, we'll turn it into sandwiches and we'll turn it into all kinds of stuff. And it's just delicious. Um, so I, word of word of advice, folks, you don't have to wait until Thanksgiving to have turkey. You can have it anytime you want. Uh, but I'm, I'm looking forward to talking about Thanksgiving dishes. And Rich, I did not go first last week. And it came back to bite me because you ended up winning with uh, with frozen junior mints, which I was going to say next. And you completely beat me to the punch. So I'm going first this time. Um, and I'm going to start it off. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go protein wise. Not everybody, not everybody is like 100% in camp turkey. So ham versus turkey. Is that for me? Mm -hmm. uh, I love ham. I absolutely love ham. So Ooh. yeah. So if forced I forced to yeah, choose, you're going ham. If I was forced to choose, I'd choose ham. Um, but that's hard. It's they're so good. They're both so good. They're so good, but ham is in ham is in the lead, Rich. Yeah. I'm gonna Where call that a round one upset, just yeah. right out of the gate. Turkey <laughs> eliminated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ham is uh, is the leader uh, right now. So okay, um, let's go with that. Uh, what the heck? Let's let's just go hard here, Matt. Ham versus stuffing. Ham. He's sticking with ham. Yeah, That's even even if it. the stuffing is my wife's perfect stuffing that doesn't go in the bird, she puts it in a glass container. It's only like an inch, inch and a half thick, cooks it covered, so it's it's well cooked. And then she removes the cover and gets that crispiness across the top. It is perfect. I'd still go in ham. <laughs> Don't oh, tell her. You're making my <laughs> you're making my stomach grumble. I'm getting hungry now. Uh so you you also said there was a really funny um when we, were, we were telling you what we were going to do. You said there was a really funny debate at, uh, at IT Nation. What, what, what yeah, happened at, with that? At, at one of the meal breakouts, I don't know how, stuffing came up. Well, Thanksgiving came up and we're sitting around the table. And we started talking about how we prepare the stuffing and, and the things people put in the stuffing. It was fascinating. And I go, well, we, my wife and I, we prepare ours kind of boring. It's, it's just traditional, but it's the way we cook it in the oven. Um, but other people were talking about the different uh, meats that they put into the stuffing and stuff um and i'm going we usually ours is largely you know the breadcrumbs celery spices and stuff um i've never done meats and yeah some people some people were really adamant it's not stuffing if you haven't put different meats in it i thought you serve it with meat like you, why would you put meat in the stuffing that's kind of weird but i'm like i'm more traditional too but i i, I some people put like cranberries and raisins and and like what yeah, do you cranberries are really in good there? in it do you like cranberries and oh. in, in, in stuffing? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Rich, what about you? Uh, yes or no on cranberries? <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. Thumbs up. Yeah. Do you guys yeah, ever make the stuff? Have, mm. have you ever made your cranberries from scratch? You buy the whole cranberries, you, you cook them in a pot. I, I, I believe no. I believe Donna, my, my wife, uh, Donna, who what's, what was her name? She did that one year, and then I think she determined that it was it was way too much work so oh, we did we do that every well it makes way too much but um ever since the first year my wife did that and then she got a little bit of orange grind, uh, rind and uh, shaved it up and put it in there oh my god it's f so much better than store-bought you've got i know but then you don't get that classic like came out of a can shape that the you know the traditional cranberry that's from the can comes into. different you gotta... product <laughs> <laughs> but it's the shape that's important all right let's yeah, uh I loved let's it as a kid <laughs> let's move on so we're at ham you we did ham versus stuffing so let's go um ham is still in there we'll go ham versus 
mashed potatoes with the perfect gravy. Oh. Still ham. Still ham. We might have to eliminate protein from this because I, I don't think you I don't think any side dish is going to win over ham. But let's well, let's, let's keep going. I have a dessert item in mind that will trump ham, but I'm sure we'll get. Well, we haven't even gotten to the desserts, right? Yeah, I'm I'm hanging on because that that might just sort of end this thing. So I've I've been waiting on the dessert, but um, so ham has beaten mashed potatoes and stuffing, um, and by extension, because you you brought gravy in there, so gravy, nothing turkey, it's good, but not good enough. What else? What what else do we have? uh on the table there that well you know what we, we were just talking about uh cranberries ham versus uh cranberry sauce well if it's my wife's homemade cranberry sauce i'd have to go with cranberry sauce because it's it's almost a dessert it is so good high praise high praise not gonna go dessert yet uh a favorite in this house will go cranberry cranberry versus Green bean casserole. I'm not a fan of green bean casserole. Okay, interesting. Interesting, Rich. I, we I might like, have to. I, I like green beans alone, you know, and just lightly cooked so they're still crunchy. Lots of butter, but uh, I've never <laughs> liked green bean casserole. What about you, Rich? I, I I do like it. My my favorite Thanksgiving green side dish is uh, roasted Brussels sprouts, but I'm yes. Done. Thumbs up on yeah, where they're crispy and yeah. caramelized. Oh, awesome! See, I want I want Thanksgiving now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, I don't, and we have to wait a whole week <laughs> to get to get all this stuff. Yep. All right, Rich. Um, let's see. Uh, how many how many turns have I had? Is that three? I think we. Uh, was that? I think it's, you. I think you get one more. So I think okay. you're going to end up winning this because I think I know where you're going to go. Uh, well, and we'll we'll see what happens. You know, I I think it is time to go to dessert, but then we'll see because there might be a dessert surprise um, in here. So I'll I'll go with the obvious dessert. Um, and and it's a good segue because the the cranberries in in the lead right now are practically a dessert. So cranberries versus pumpkin pie. Pumpkin. Went with the wrong pie, Rich. I, I I love pumpkin pie. Not not my favorite pie. But I love pumpkin pie. Okay, swooping in for the win. Pumpkin pie versus pecan pie. Go. Oh. I'd probably still go pumpkin because pecan, it's so sweet. I get a sugar high. It just like kills me. <laughs> oh, I thought I thought for sure I was gonna nail the pie. All right, Rich, I'm gonna give you one more, one more pie. We gotta discover his favorite pie. <laughs> <laughs> uh well, um uh pumpkin pie versus apple pie. Apple pie all the way, better than the whole dinner. <laughs> and Rich, Rich swoops in for the I even went first and you still came back for the win, coming up <laughs> with the right pie. I thought it was for sure pecan was gonna was gonna take it, but yeah, it is hard to beat good old classic apple pie. So kudos to Rich for coming up with that. Ed, very interesting choices. I've learned a lot about how your brain works, or at least your brain in relation to your Thanksgiving taste buds, which is still very, very interesting uh, as well. So fun, fun for that. So Rich, I'll, I'll just ask, what is your favorite Thanksgiving dish? Oh gosh, of any kind. Um, it, it There are so many, but pro probably stuffing would have would have won out. Uh, and again, like you, you said, mashed potatoes with the gravy, stuffing with gravy, and you know what? Maybe what it is is um, turkey. You can have turkey anytime. I, I pretty much never have stuffing except on Thanksgiving, and I enjoy it a lot. Maybe that makes it kind of special in that way. That extra special treat of uh, stuffing on Thanksgiving. We just need to have Thanksgiving every week, and then life would be so much better. So let's do let's do that. Uh, awesome stuff. Well, Ed, I want to say uh, thanks so much. We won't say goodbye quite yet. Uh, we gotta we gotta break down the show first. Uh, so, Rich, before we say goodbye to Ed, uh, tell us um, what we might have missed. I, did we do it in case you missed it this week? We'll find out. And then tell us um, what might be to come, not next week, because we all know what's coming next week, which is all of these awesome foods that we were just talking about, but what might be coming up the week after that? Yeah, well, um, you know, we we uh, alluded to the In Case You Missed It post that James Gaskin has been writing uh, for us for a, uh, a long while now. Um, 
Uh, we do indeed have, in case you missed it, coming up on the website uh, this Friday, tomorrow, November 18th. Um, he's going to be talking about some high-performance computing hardware from Dell that came out this week, some server and um, uh, hyperconverged infrastructure hardware from Lenovo, um, some Zoom Room gear from uh, HP and their Poly unit. It's easy to forget Poly is part of HP now, but they are, and they have some Zoom Room stuff out there. And then... Um, just just in the wake of the recent election, um, James has a few notes about an election, a local election settled somewhere in this country, literally by people drawing a slip of paper out of a hat. He'll tell you all about that. Um, again, coming up next week, turkey, gravy, ham, cranberries, what, whatever you like. Um, after that, um, you know, it, the, the year starts to kind of tail off. Uh, a little bit. Um, a AWS is doing its reInvent uh, event, I believe, the week after next. And I'm sure we're going to hear a lot, a lot from them about um, what they've got coming up. But um, we're, we're heading into that slower period of the year um, uh, event-wise. And you're going to see, I, I think, fewer product releases and so on and so forth as we all get ready uh, for the holidays. Yeah, awesome stuff. And of course, folks, uh, we want to know what your favorite thanksgiving dishes are is there one that we missed i mean we didn't we didn't cover all of the, the the typical staples but is there one that's a favorite for you go to the comment section on youtube uh have have a have a lively debate there on thanksgiving side dishes or uh, uh send us an email podcast at channel network.com and let us know your picks uh for thanksgiving dinners um rich there's one other last thing we gotta get to real quick before we say goodbye and that is we've got uh, big news on the event front because i do believe our 2023 event schedule is now publicly available. Do you want to talk about that real quick? Yeah, well, I can talk a little bit about um, you know what, what and when we're doing um, without getting too much into the uh, the content specifically. But this this is uh, we, we are coming up on Channel Pro's biggest best year ever on events. We uh, we are going to be doing twelve events total in 2023. So we're going to have something for you every month. Eight of those will be um, face to face in person. Four of them will be um, uh, online summit events. First one of those, by the way, takes place um, in January. I believe it's January 18th, and that's going to be dedicated to managed and cloud uh, services. But we're, we're going to be doing two of those managed cloud services online summits, two cybersecurity online summits over the course of the year. We're going to be um, in seven cities around the country doing our SMB forum events. And then um, November 2023, we're going to be doing our first um, security specific in-person event and also our first multi-day event. And this is going to be a two-day event. We are um, doing it in partnership with CompTIA. Um, uh, I actually have a meeting tomorrow, just, you know, meet with uh, one of their folks over there and start uh, talking about content. So super excited about that. Um, that'll be coming up. Um, we're going to be doing it in Southern California um, right at the beginning of November. And um, we are uh, planning to put something together for you folks that will uh, hopefully motivate some of you to make the trip to California in November. Multi-day event. You don't have to be California, Arizona, Nevada to justify this trip. Um, this is going to be uh, an event where we're looking to, uh, to motivate, inspire people to make the trip into California and combine two days of really actionable um, in-depth security content with a visit to Disneyland. <laughs> the most he, important he part the, of the trip. He gets, he gets the important part in, in at the end. <laughs> and Disneyland. <laughs> and Disneyland, of course. Uh, yeah, it's going to be, what an exciting um, uh, year it's looking to be in 2023. Uh, we're going to throw a graphic up on the screen. There's a QR code on it. Uh, go ahead and just get registered uh, right away. The 2023 events are going to fill up. So um, the virtual ones won't fill up, but get, go ahead and get on the calendar early. But like things will will fill up. They will Spots will go fast. Um, it is, uh, do we have a promo code? Yes, we do have a promo code. Uh, CP Weekly is going to be the promo code for to use that will bypass the, the fee so you can register um, without uh, without having to pay. But yeah, get, get on there because it's going to be it's going to be an awesome, awesome year. Go and get registered for one or more of those uh, events, particularly the, the security one in November. That's going to be that's going to be a big one. That's going to be awesome. So uh, do that. Of course, Richard, we also we're not even done with events with 2022 yet. <laughs> believe it or not, we've got one more of those coming up. Which one is that? That is uh, our, our second of two cybersecurity online summits for 2022. That takes place on December 7th. Virtual event, folks, we never run out of room. So go to events.channelpronetwork.com and uh, check it out. We're going to, uh, I am moderating a panel with um, some very experienced um, pen testers, and we're going to talk a little bit about what they learn on the job and uh, how you can apply that uh, to what you are doing. 
Um, uh, oh gosh, uh, I've been on the road so much that uh, some of these sessions have slipped my mind. Uh, and so I'm stalling as I go to our website quickly to remind myself um, who else or what else we are talking about uh, and why isn't our... Uh, well, you know what, folks? The best way to find out is to go to events.channelpronetwork.com and look it up for yourself. We, we, we've got something on um, a smart gadget, an Internet of Things security event, which um, if, if you don't know how relevant that is right now, you really need to attend uh, the session. Um, we have the return of um, Ian Thornton Trump. Um, we did, um, I think this is last year um, when we were doing one of our cybersecurity online summits, um, Ian Trump, a great, great security expert, came on and he comes on live and he just answers your questions and um, he got a ton of them. It was a lot of fun, very, very informative. He's going to be doing it again for us on December 7th. Um, we've got a, a session actually that applies to something Ed was talking about before. Um, there is a lot of noise, a lot of security noise. You know, how, how do you, you can't respond to everything that might be an issue. And so um, I'm actually going to be doing a session on um, putting threat intelligence to work, like practical tips on figuring out what you need to know, how to stay informed about that, um, how to act on it. So anyway, events.channelpronetwork.com, um, folks, it's going to be a really great event. It takes place December 7th. And uh, please join us. Yeah, it's gonna be awesome. And I'm so glad you mentioned the the one with Ian Thornton Trump because we don't often redo a session like have it again. That one, like people have asked about that. Like we like we got to do another one with those because it was so awesome and so much fun. So I'm so excited that Ian's gonna come back and and do another one. It was uh, it was great. You, it, attend just for that one alone. Trust me, it's really really good. Uh, big thanks to Ed Ed Correa. I see. I I haven't gotten that whole uh, rolling our things uh, down pat today. Uh, big Goody thanks for coming on. Goes together. <laughs> big <laughs> thanks for coming on today uh, and for for joining us for yet another episode. Um, hope you had fun. Always fun. I love it. <laughs> awesome, awesome stuff. And uh, for for those who want to learn more about you, connect with you, learn more about Sagacent, where can they go? How can they find you? Uh, either go to my website sagacent.com or uh, ting, connect to me on LinkedIn. Awesome. And I hope I hope folks do. And I, uh, I I look forward to your next appearance here with us uh, on Channel Pro Weekly. And uh, and I know you've, you've been involved with uh, with some of our events in the past. I'm sure we'll probably see you in some of those as well uh, going forward. So big thanks again for coming on. Uh, and where else can you go besides the event site uh, to learn about our events? Well, there's a whole nother one. ChannelProNetwork.com is where you should go. Set it as your homepage. Go there each and every day. Uh, that's where you're going to find the latest news, articles, white papers, resources, downloads, all kinds of stuff to help keep you informed of what's going on in this uh, crazy, fast-moving IT industry, uh, or, or or things like uh, the one article we talked about earlier, which is going to give you some sound business advice on how to service your customers, make more money, hire uh, every topic imaginable. Go and uh, check those out. You wanna, won't want to miss any of that. And of course, subscribe to the Channel for Weekly Podcast everywhere podcasts are found. We're on the Google, the, St the Spotify, the Stitchers. Subscribe to it everywhere. Leave a rating. Uh, it was a good, leave a good rating. I should say, <laughs> please leave a good rating. It, it, it would be appreciated. And of course, if you're on YouTube, hit the subscribe, hit the bell, hit all that stuff. And then uh, leave a comment there. And uh, tell your friends. That's that's the most important one. Tell your friends, tell your coworkers, tell your colleagues that uh, you listen to Channel for Weekly. And uh, you, you should all listen every week and, ha you know, Talk about some of the stuff that we talk about here, the water cooler talk, all, all those kinds of things. But uh, Channel 4 Weekly is best enjoyed with friends. Isn't that true, Ed? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and ham. Best, Lots of ham. Best enjoyed with <laughs> friends and ham uh, <laughs> as well. So uh, so go and do that. And um, yeah, I, but I also want to give a big thanks to Rich for doing the show with me each and every week. Big, uh, big thanks as well. And I want to thank you, our awesome uh, listeners. We're coming into the end of 22 here. We've still got another month to go, but it's been a gangbusters year for Channel 4 Weekly. We've uh, we've always grown. We continue to grow our 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 mostly our audio base, <laughs> which is understandable with a with a very long format that we do. Uh, but we we our, our listening base is uh, getting bigger and bigger every every week it seems, and um and it's exciting. And we really really appreciate you for tuning in each and every week. And I hope that all of you have a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, enjoy those side dishes and and uh, different desserts and pies. And we will see everyone in episode 248 in a couple weeks. See you then. Take care.